Hello, hello. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Black Belt Barber Podcast, which this is the first podcast that talks about entrepreneurship for barbers and people from our beauty industry. My name is Tiku Invictus, and I have here my beautiful co-host. Is my wife. She's helping me in here. Hello, guys. Nice to see you in 2023. 2023. Guys, I wish you all a happy new year. And I believe this year, it, there's a lot of amazing things that's going to happen in my life, in your guys' life. I truly believe that. And I believe that you guys have an, an amazing 2022 but if you did uh, challenge, if you did have challenge moments on 2022, don't look don't look back. If you look back, look as a learning experience, and keep move on. And this year, uh, we, me and my beautiful wife, we're gonna be sharing a lot of um, information and and knowledge, everything that is happening in our beauty industry, in our industry as a barbering. So you guys. This is the new season, right? Correct. So um, we are here to help you grow your business. Even if you just rent a chair, let's say, oh, I don't have a business. Yes, you do. Your chair is your business. <laughs> and you're here to share everything you learn. Over the years, Tico, of course, has been in the industry for over 20 years. And as business owners, we learned a lot. And we're here just to share free information. If you think they are relevant, if you think this information can help someone, Make sure to subscribe to our channel and share the videos you think that can help someone. Even if you are not a barber, but you do have a barber that cut your hair, make sure you share this video with your barber and your friends from the beauty industry. So in 2023, guys, there's amazing things that is coming. Uh, if you don't, if you don't, uh, if you do have any insights uh, on our episodes, right? comment below and if you want to know something if you if you have anything in mind that you want to so that you want w we to share, to with share us or ask with, or ask we are here up to help yes okay and what go ahead yeah i hope everyone had an amazing um 2022 we had an amazing year very challenging but as tico said if you had challenges use them as a learning experience for a better 2023 every new year we always have the hopes and we and have new feeling. opportunities to make better choices yeah start all over change the things that we did wrong and keep doing the things we did right so we just want to invite you to um have hopes that 23 will be amazing and also work on your dreams Go to action. Just don't pray and hope because it won't happen overnight. It won't happen by itself if you don't actually take actions. And today, our guest, we have a special guest we have, here. We have a special guest. Who so, is it? Who is it? A round of applause for our most special guest that Me. we ever had in the podcast. I Tico. am the special guest today <laughs> because in today's podcast, guys, because I will be sharing my story. I will be sharing my journey, and I hope. Uh, everything that I'm gonna, I'm going to say will inspire you somehow. And if it did inspire you, you that can inspire someone else as well, right? Can you share the video, please? And I hope. think most viewers, um, most people that are subscribed to the channel, don't really know your story, where we, where you came from. And of course, if I say uh, how much I admire this person here how much he inspired me how much i learned with him and how much his life story uh touched me my emotions uh, i'm his wife but i want to have the opportunity that you share with them so they can get inspired too we're from completely different backgrounds tico will share more details but uh he's a winner because everything he had to go through in life you were supposed to supposed to not be here but i believe of course god has a purpose for each for one everybody. of us and if you were here it's because you're supposed to be here but looking at the circumstances he was not supposed to you know be a business owner be successful be teaching and inspiring other people based on your life story you had so many challenges and didn't have opportunities you actually created your own opportunities so how do you want to start 
from the beginning? I want to start saying that my wife cried many times, uh, heard me uh, s- talking about my 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 story, and today yeah. I believe she's gonna cry it again because yeah. I will share all the experiences, all all in my story in detail. I will share everything in detail with you guys because I hope that I believe that uh, someone else's story sometimes is aligned with ours. And our story is aligned with our purpose. Shh. You want to say something or you want me to start? No, I just wanted to start because I know your story can inspire many people that maybe are having a hard time, maybe are facing challenges to show them that it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter if you didn't have education, opportunities, money, or a structured family, or it doesn't matter. You still can build a, an amazing future for you, for your family. And you can break the cycle. And if your whole story has stories like of broken failing, home, broken yeah. home, or let's say you had issues with depression, substance abuse, or anything that happened, you can write a new story for you. We are the writer of our own story. Yes. So, so sh- start from the beginning. Start from where start, you're from. I want to start like it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It doesn't yeah. matter where you come from but only matters where you are going. So I'm gonna start saying that my name is Tico. I have 38 years old and I have a beautiful wife, Ligia Moreno. She's here, she's my co-host. I have a beautiful dog and I'm a barber over 20 years now. And I come from a family of a barbers. My dad, my dad and my two grandpa were barber. I think, I believe it that it is in the blood. And my mission here is to teach and change other people's life in my industry through our education because I believe that's the only way. Education, open doors, education is freedom. And uh, from through through Invictus Academy, I teach all the barbers that I do it today. And I'm very, very happy and proud of that because I seen I change in it and I ha- help people to be more prosper and successful. And all these young kids that I teach, like from nothing, from from zero, they never hold a pair of clippers before, and now they have a career. So I do own a barbershop that call Invictus Barbershop. It's gonna be, it's gonna turn like six years now here in Coconut Creek, Florida, and. I'm going to start saying that um, I came from a very, very small town in Brazil. It's like uh, I came from a farm, the closest city, the closest biggest city from my home, my, uh, my hometown is like an hour driving. And what I have to say is my like I was saying, my my father and my two grandpa, they were barber, my father had to work in plantations, and I do have seven brothers too. I'm the sixth one of them, the sixth, sixtieth. Six. I'm the sixth of uh, all of them. You're number one six of the. I'm number seven. six of seven. <laughs> yeah. I'm one of the youngest. I have someone that uh, a younger brother. He's 35 now, 35, 36. I, I even forgot that. You don't know his age. <laughs> yeah, all my brothers are here, but my fa- my my parents still. Uh, back in my hometown. My hometown back in two, two, 20, 2010, Google uh, did a, uh, a research. I did a research on Google. Google was saying that my hometown had less than a thousand people uh, as a population living in that town. Very, very small town. And my, my, my father, like I, was, I mentioned before, my father had to work in plantations in a field to raise seven kids seven kids they taught me good values people they gave me everything they had back then on their uh how do i say that word whatever they had back then they they gave it to me at all so my mother used to be a housewife you know uh taking care of seven seven kids kids. (laughs) and also she helped my my father and my family very, very, very poor, money-wise, saying, but I, I had, I believe that I have, I had, a amazing childhood. When I was a kid, we used to play uh, soccer after uh, after school uh, on the weekends. How you call pipa? Uh, pipa. Ooh. I don't know. I don't know how you guys call pipa in English. 
Yeah. Uh, I don't see this actually. He I don't see kids here in the US playing, playing with pipa. I saw at the beach. That's the thing you put in the air and you have this line that I don't know the name, guys. Pipa. We used to play soccer on the Google. street on the bare f with a bare foot. We used to play marbles all day. We didn't have a computer or cell phone back then. Uh, one thing that I, I I studied my whole life in a public school as well. Uh, Can you mention about like that your actually Tico's house? Um, they didn't have uh, a bathroom. Yeah, a real a bathroom with plumbing. Mm -hmm. It was so yeah. so poor. I forgot the name in English. Can you find out? Uh, I'm researching about the people. We didn't have a bathroom with a shower. Kite. Bathroom. So pipa in English is called kite. Oh, kite. Yeah. Kite. Like so kite Tico surfing and and. I used to play with kites with my, I used to do everything. I used to make my own, all the because we didn't have the money to, all the to resources buy. To, to buy. And we used to go on the fields and cut the little uh, piece of wood, uh, the sticks, make with the plastic bags. And we bought uh, strings to, I, I believe is surfing with a kite. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Were you talking about the bathroom that you said for me to yeah, research we didn't, about it? Yeah, uh, we did How do you call bathroom that you make the how the holes on a on a? Oh, a I have no idea, guys. Yeah. But that was shocking when Tico shared with me that he didn't have a bathroom, like a toilet. So he had to go outside and there was a hole. <laughs> and then he would, he couldn't see it. It's crazy to think It's just like the, the, on a construction little bathroom that they have the blue uh little but they do have a bathroom you didn't have one you didn't have like a toilet that you could see oh, no, in the yeah. toilet it was just a hole on the floor yeah my dad dig that hole and that's what i mean yeah. like it was shocking to me to think about how could you live in a house that didn't have a toilet it's something that i'll never imagine how it's possible yeah right? years gone by we got better yeah of course but we didn't even have a shower we used to warm up the water and get little by little with a uh, um, kind of a bucket, a, right? A bucket or a, a mug, a, a mug, and shower, and shower ourselves. A very very small town, and actually, I am very proud of everything my parents gave and taught us, my brothers, my family, because nowadays we we don't have any crim any criminals in our family. We have uh, people that respect each other, hard worker people, but. I was telling about the school. I my whole life I stood in a in, public, in school. a public school. I remember that I didn't have a backpack. I had a bag that come. You know when you buy a bread, and they they put the breads in the in the bag. That that was my backpack. But nowadays they don't. They use either plastic or paper i think you're talking about the thing that looks like fabric but it's not really fabric no it's a thicker bag yep it's a it's a bag plastic bag back then but it was a very thick uh, bag so if it i've seen rices big packages of rices they use that oh, material oh that one yeah is i don't know the name of that material is yeah that one that one right and because of my pa parents couldn't afford a backpack they they used to make those bags so I can put put all my uh, pants and and my your school supplies my school supplies. So if it rains, it didn't go wet, get wet. I had to walk like what's close. My 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 house was close to the school because the city was very small, right? Yeah. And I used to walk then, and then I upgrade that backpack for uh, my mom. She used to be a tailor, you know, and she cut. Just to clarify, back then, women would do so many things besides cooking. Anybody they would, would do so many things. Even. Yeah, they couldn't afford buying, paying someone. They had to learn how to do it. Like your dad built the house himself. My my, bad, my dad built the house. He he built the stove. He he actually did everything. didn't have a stove. So guys, these electric stoves no, or yeah. even if you use is it gas that they call propane. Propane. So um, Tico didn't have a stove. We do have did have the fire. Firewood, firewood. Exactly. 
uh, you know, firewood. What is I don't know how they call fogão a lenha in English, but, but it's the, it was not a real stove that the way we the way we are used to seeing houses. Yeah, in farms it's very common. They use a piece of wood and put fire on it and, yes. and make fire in it. That's like but <laughs> the then cave time. The ca yeah, people it's from a hundred years ago would cook that way, but you were not born a hundred years ago. So besides not having a bathroom, you didn't have like a stove as we know, <laughs> right? It was a very simple, simple house. Very, very simple life. Very so, simple life. And my, my, my dad used to work in a plantation, but he built a whole house. He was a carpenter too. He also was a barber. You know, <laughs> he, he had to learn. They had to do and learn every everything. single thing because they couldn't afford. He used to do all the electrical part, the plumbing. Imagine the fire the hazard, guys. <laughs> no permits, no nothing. <laughs> And oh my gosh. Yeah, my mom did saw. She cut a piece of my uh, or old pan, pants. Jeans, right? Jeans. And she saw the bottom and leave the top open. And we put like a, not a hanger. How how you call this? Something that you can hang on the shoulder. You put in between the two sides. And that was my backpack. That's my upgraded, upgraded backpack. backpack. So you never had a real backpack as we know, right? Yeah, The ones we were used to it. Yeah, in Brazil, never. I never had. Of course, when I got older, of course, in school, I was about to in high finish school, the right. school. Yeah. And ch things start changing. And I studied in a public school. Uh, I repeat one year in a public school because I have ADHD. For many of you guys don't know that. And I didn't. Actually, I just did, fi I did finish high school over there. And that's it. I didn't go to college or anything. You want me to share anything else that you remember? Yeah, about the school. How how was your school life? The challenges you had? Because I remember you didn't know you had ADHD and the teachers yeah, didn't back, know any better at that time. Back then, teachers didn't have enough information uh, about ADHD. Like even like 10 years ago, ADHD wasn't a thing. Correct. And back then, the teachers couldn't, uh, how do you say? Uh, analyze you and then guide you in a different direction and give you uh, how do I explain and this? help I you right because kids with HDAD it's not it doesn't affect your overall intelligence but it affects the way you learn especially depending on how uh, hyper you are you can't really focus because your mind is being so everywhere. fast everywhere then you're not really focused because they want you to see it like the other kids and just watch and learn and write and you couldn't do that so can you talk about the challenges and what happened i had a lot of challenges that i couldn't focus and also teachers used to call me dumb call me dunk everybody that's around me didn't understand back then why i couldn't learn i repeat my i third i think is the third year third grade Th third grade I repeat once, and all my, my best friends in that class, they, they kept moving forward one year ahead of me, and I was feeling so sad because... You're left behind. I left behind, and... <laughs> and also, not only the teachers bullied you, um, instead of helping, right? They would bully you and kind of not give you any attention. Because what happened with kids with HDAD, and the reason why I know that, it's because... My mom is a specialized, she's a teacher specialized in learning disorders. And since I was a kid, I'm used to see her dealing with kids, not only with HDAD, but other conditions that actually affect their learning because HDAD doesn't. And the teachers were just kind of ignoring you because kids with HDAD, they can't just sit still for five, six hours. And they have energy, so they create kind of a fuzz in the room because then they want to play with their friends and they don't want to pay attention. And sometimes they don't behave the way teachers expect and they don't know how to handle that kid. And they don't have much patience. They didn't have much patience with me. I was all over the class. <laughs> and for me, it was so difficult because while the, the, the teach, teacher was writing on the bo one side of the board, and I wasn't paying attention. When he finished that side, the, 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 the right side, the, the last side of the board, they come and, and erase. erase that side. And I couldn't write 
uh, fast enough, and I never. All my my. Uh, Caderno, how you say? Your notebooks what, were my missing. My notebooks were missing stuff. Never yeah. completed. And I repeat, the third grade was very overwhelming for me because I couldn't understand. I didn't have any answer. And the elders, the people that are older than me, everybody around, they didn't know how to how to help me as well. And all and they, they knew it was bully, how to right? judge, how to judge and bully me. And put you down, putting calling you down. names. Mm -hmm. and, and that creates a, a, a kind of... A, belief in me mm -hmm. it's, it's, I, I blocked myself to learn because they were always repeating like oh you're dumb Every, you're stupid why year, you can't do anything right and why then you, you start why you forgot things so fast yep. why you can't focus in this thing be before you finish to move to another that was very overwhelming for me one thing and that Tico I was always I can't imagine because he does that nowadays I can't imagine he him as a kid in the classroom just like this looking around and his imagination fly. yeah but i couldn't sit still too <laughs> <And> <laughs> I couldn't sit still because sometimes i look at tico and he's like this i'm flying away and i know that his mind is spinning with ideas with it's, it's fantastic, funny fantastic world of bob, of bob. <laughs> so yeah i had this diarrhea because i i didn't learn the uh whatever was, was thought back then and then you I, get anxious, we had to right anxious and i had diarrhea because every time they call me on uh on the front to explain something i didn't learn what was explained it so i had diarrhea i was so nervous i forgot things i i was so embarrassed i remember you telling me that every single day he would go to school when every he had diarrhea for single, real for because years. your soul afraid of being called if the teacher had a question and he would say your name you would freak out so you were afraid of going to school in the sense you're a kid you couldn't process that emotion you didn't know what was going on but you had terrible diarrheas every single day because you're so afraid that the teacher would ask you a question and you didn't know the answer yes i had this anxious and diarrhea all the time and also the education in a in in those small cities yeah. wasn't that uh, with a high level of information. Yeah. That's how I can I can explain that, right? So, as like you, you you did have a better education, better education because I'm from a big city, and besides city. being from the big city, I also studied in um, private schools where the education is much better. So when Tico told me details about his story is so different from my experience as a kid that it's, shock it's shocking to think that a kid had to go through all that trauma and all those terrible experiences in school instead of being a place of learning and fun you were terrified of going to school but i never take that as a as a excuse excuses because my life goes on i always had this open mind I believe that's helped me to become who I am today because I'm always a thinker, always uh, having good ideas, open mind to everything, to learn. You know, one thing that really uh, didn't help, <laughs> really uh, make me, uh, it was very hard for me, it was very challenging because my parents, they had the background because they never had the opportunity to go to school because their parents were very poor. And my parents never taught me how to read how to hold a book after school and read and learn they couldn't they help you either right they because they didn't they know couldn't help me because they didn't know better yeah and they never sit by my side and let's let's let me help you with this uh homework and that, all that i had to do all myself and all my brothers was the same but wasn't their fault wasn't their fault because they gave me everything they had back then what they had was the education their parents gave it to them Right. right and all these challenges didn't prevent you from becoming an amazing professional in your in your field and also your brothers that also have a profession uh, there's they're doing great too so these didn't prevent anybody from making a better future their circumstances the lack of education the lack of opportunities didn't prevent anybody from having an amazing life now and providing a better life for their kids. 
yeah, it didn't prevent me, but of course, in uh, in a way, was was a very challenge from challenge uh, challenging. It was very challenging for me because since I didn't know how to read, I mean properly, and now when you are older and you have all this other stuff going on, all these responsibilities, you have things going on that you have to take care of it, and then you have to learn how to study, how to read, and, and all that stuff, how to like to read and Correct. you know and then let's fast forward to the point that you moved to the u.s so what brought you here how did you move here from the countryside less than a thousand people in population very very poor childhood how yeah. did you end up coming here since since my 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 seat was very small we had a little church like a soccer field a school everybody knows each other and since they didn't have that much opportunity, my older brothers start uh, leaving the country to other countries, Portugal, England, and big cities in Brazil. And when everybody was uh, in the United States, because when they, went, when they went to Portugal, after they came to the United States, and I saw a opportunity to come and take new chances and embrace the opportunity my brothers was given to me. They were here in the United States. I came here in 2002 when I was when I was 17 years old. As an immigrant, I had to do a ton of work, uh, sub, sub jobs, they call sub uh, jobs. Minimum wage. Minimum wage jobs, jobs, you know. But just to clarify, like think about this way. If you live in a city that you have no jobs, you have no college, you have no opportunities, um, it's very common that these small cities, very poor cities in, let's say, third world countries, they want, they have this dream of migra migrating to another big country. Big cities. Big cities, yeah. It happens a countries. lot. I'm from Sao Paulo, so there's a lot of immigrants from Brazil, actually. They move from small cities to bigger, bigger cities, cities looking for jobs, looking opportunities. For opportunities. So um, a lot of Brazilians that come to the U.S., and this used to happen a uh, a lot years ago that they were from small cities with no opportunities and they came here with a dream i'm gonna have a job i'm gonna have a better life i'll go there and work hard to build the future i want and then your brothers your older the, the well, oldest no. was the first one right to yeah they to they, migrate first and time they they migrate here was in uh in the 19 in the 90s 90s, 90s. Yeah, in 2002, I came to the States. Imagine... Uh, uh, so they want to help you have a better future too because they came to the U.S. and they saw the opportunities. They were working hard. And then they motivate you. They like, motivated me to come, come. and live with us. You can have a better life here. That's what yes. happened, which yeah. is very common. between Because people watching sometimes, they have no idea how is the life of an immigrant. Well, we have to go through the challenges. And that's what I'm going to share here now. Yeah, and then they decided to bring you to help you have a better life here in the U.S. Imagine if you're there with a thousand people living in the city. What would you do? What would you work doing what? Like the, what opportunities the you would have? The opportunity you have there is to work in plantations, in the agriculture, and doing dealing with animals like a cow and milking cow and all that stuff. So in 2002, I, I migrated to the United States. Thank God I had the help of my, my uh, family. My wife didn't have the same help because she came by herself. And my first job was a, as a dishwasher. Dishwasher, for who don't know, you wash dishes in a restaurant, a very, very busy restaurant in Boston. Uh, the, I was getting paid, I think it was seven fifty an hour. And I worked in as a dishwash for over five months in this restaurant. My brothers, we used to work there. They helped me to get this job. And in the kitchen, you have stages, you have ranks, you have, uh, you, if you want to learn and how to become a cooker, you have the opportunity, but you have to go, have to learn all the stations first. Dishwasher, uh, the salad bar, salad bar, you had to learn how to do everything, how to cut fruits and vegetables and all that stuff then you go to the kitchen and learn each step so that's why my wife loves me because now i know how to cook well since my mom taught me well too when i was nine years old and after a year working in a restaurant 
I, my brothers, some of them used to work in the construction and demolition and painting and all that stuff. They gave me an opportunity. I worked for a few months or, or even more in a construction. I did everything. I did painting, demolition, carpentry. Uh, I did cleaning. I cleaned restaurant after hours between midnight and like six in the morning. I cleaned houses with my sister-in-law. All of that helped me be, helped me become who I am today. I take I take that as an experience, and I I always had this gift God gave me to me. I knew how to hold a pair of clippers. I didn't know, but uh, something is just fall in my lap, meaning that all my friends look at me and can you cut my hair? All my uh, my my brothers, can you cut my hair today? I have a party. I'm not a barber. I just have have these clippers from Walmart back then, and I start cutting hair back then uh, of my family and my friends. And one day I had this barber that used to cut my hair in Framingham, Massachusetts. And back then I used to live in Boston. I used to drive like 30 minutes to cut my hair. You see, guys, whoever what whatever clients there, whoever are watching this podcast as a client. You know, I drove like over 30 minutes to cut my hair. So now I understand why people drive like an hour or even more, three hours to cut the hair with us, with me. And what was his name, the barber's name? Pito, Pito Shout Navarra. Out Pito. Shout out to Pito. Pito, thank you, every, thank you very much Wait, for the support. For the, <laughs> thank you for the support, everything the, that you gave, you helped me, everything. The first pair of clippers... Pito gave it to me because one day I was sitting in his chair, cutting my hair. I mentioned that I was cutting my my uh, friends and my brothers in a bathroom, and I was I remember I was his last client of the day. It was really late at night, 9:30, 10 p.m. Uh, the barbershop called Grandes Ligas Barbershop. Papalot Papalotti used to be the owner. He he is a uh, Dominican guy, really an amazing guy. Now he don't want that, that barbershop. He owns uh, another barbershop in Framingham. And Pito didn't have a car back then. He, he was going through a, a tough situation too. He had a kid, divorce, and all that stuff. And I gave him a lift. And he told me when, when I arrived to his house, he told me, hold, hold on one second. And he went up. He climbed the, the stairs, went up, got his, a pair of clippers, a pair of uh, Rostec, uh, Shears gave it to me and told me, now this is your opportunity to ask Papalotti, Papalotti to work with us, you know, have an opportunity to work at Grandes Ligas. I remember I was asked, I wasn't a professional, I didn't have license back then, and I asked Papalotti many times, I believe it was like around 14, 15 times. <laughs> he always reject because, of course, I didn't have, I didn't have license. He always asked if I was a barber, right, I, I, I was telling the truth. I, I wasn't a barber, but I won an opportunity. Finally, he gave me this opportunity. I was I was renting a chair, paying $100 every Saturday without made, making any any money. I was paying for, out of my pocket. Pito was the one that was there, and I was sitting uh, in the uh, waiting area and watching all the barbers cutting. And once I had the opportunity and I asked Pito, I was like shattering Pito right there and asking how he cuts those amazing Puerto Rican fades. Pito, it is a Puerto Rican. And I was sharing him and watching him. Can he was I the make most a comment. Hold on, but he was he was the he was the most uh barber required in the barbershop back then. He was the best of the whole team. He was there, the right? best of the whole team. He was the busiest. I was learning from him constantly, and I started bringing uh, kids from high school, my f my really good friends, my family members, and Peter was there teaching me and guiding me. So I, I'm I'm blessed to have the opportunity. The that comment I want to make is regarding that that um, I noticed hearing stories from different barbers that there was always someone that supported them, that actually tell them you should do this, you're good at or it. Or support them to give them or the first teach them step. Like you, Pete, Peter gave you the tools, Peter was like, come work here. He was your biggest supporter at the time. And one thing you shared with me is that P 
people surrounding you, your friends, your family, your girlfriend at the time, no one wanted you to be a barber. <laughs> no one said, hey, go do it. And then Peter was that person. And Papalotti also was the person that gave you your first job opportunity, even though you had no experience and no license because we're not supposed to work without a license, right? And he still gave you that chance that completely changed your life forever. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that opportunity. And every story I hear from a barber, there was always that person that was the person that gave them the first opportunity or gave them the first motivation and support to become barbers. And I think as a barber, we have, I mean, I'm not a barber, but you guys as a barber or a beauty professional, you have this duty to be that supporter for other people that want to start in the industry. There, w there is always someone and that's to blast. help you. So why not you be that support for someone else? You can change someone's life forever. With one word, what power clippers or if you're teaching them something, yeah. that's the opportunity to give them some. You know, uh, one of my students uh, back here in Florida, his mom asked me on the first week of the ABC Bar, ask, is this kid has a future with this? I say, he's already have a gift. He learned fast, he's smart, he's creative, he's hungry to learn this. And he's an amazing, so, talented barber, and by then, the way, nowadays. What I said, he has a tremendous impact in his life because who was supporting him financial-wise was his mom and his parent. Correct. So when I said that, he might open her mind and say, I'm going to keep helping him. Yes. You know? Sometimes parents are afraid. We talk a lot about that. They are afraid that being a barber is not a profession. They want their kids to go to college because they want the best for their kids. And sometimes they want you to become something that it's not what you want. But they're just trying to help you have a better future, right? And they think being a barber is not a profession or being any beauty professional like manicure or massage therapist or whatever it might be the case eyelash specialist um sometimes it's seen as oh this is not a profession you're not gonna have a future oh yes you can have an amazing future <laughs> you do and that's uh nowadays is, is a little bit different but back then 20 years ago everybody crucified me everybody used to judge me yes but everybody used to put my 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 ex-girlfriend my brothers everybody used to point the finger at me and say this is a lazy job you want to be a barber because you want to be a lay you you are lazy you want to work in an ac nice and clean say oh, that's something that i like to do you know i was doing construction something that i wasn't happy to do and pito pito gave me this first uh uh, the first contact with this with the beauty industry and I'm so glad for his life he blasted my life and now I bless a lot of people and I worked over there for many years and I believe like she was saying that we have the duty that as a barber in a, in a beauty industry everybody that's in a beauty industry to help others you know because I truly believe you had someone in your life that pushes you that motivates you that inspires said some word that taught you something so that's our duty to help others so I worked in uh Grandes Ligas for over two years I was working there I used to still used to live in Boston uh, when I when I started I used to live in Boston and drive 35 minutes to the Grandes Ligas and work and since I didn't have any clientele, no clients in the first like year, because that's the, the first year is the time that you build your own clientele. You have a lot of challenges. I had to use the money out of my pocket to pay my the chair. I remember it was a hundred dollars every. It was a lot of money. Twenty you know? years ago, yeah. Twenty Hun years ago, a hundred dollars was a With lot. With no clients, not making money, and you're still paying the chair. I was paying from the construction money. You know, I was doing construction uh, from in the morning till five. After five, I, dro I drove to Framingham, worked throughout uh, from six to 10, 11. We had uh, the key because Papa Lato used to trust the barbers. Each one has the key. And we opened the barbershop in the morning. And whenever it finished the, the shift, we, we closed the barbershop, clean, and help everybody. 
I worked over there for two years, and I remember I, I worked in Boston for another three months with one of the best Brazilian barbers. Uh, his name is Alfredo. He inspired me so much because I cut my hair so many years with him as well. He's one of, was in Boston. So Frame is one city, Boston is another. And he was one of the most Brazilian barber, popular barber in uh, Boston. Every single young man, young kid used to cut the hair with Alfredo. And I kept watching Alfredo, why he became so busy. And he was fast in cutting hair. He used to do four haircuts in one hour. And he gave me many opportunities. He used to give me those, uh, I, I can't call leftover clients, right? I can call the clients that he couldn't serve. He say, try Tico, he's amazing barber. He's starting giving him the opportunity. And if there's anything happen, I'm here. And that's how I started. And in 2008, I moved to Florida. I had uh, two cousins living here. My first uh, degree cousins, first degree cousins. They moved to Florida in that year too, in 2008 or a year before. And I came here, I called them, I called him, actually, Elio, and say, said, Elio, can, I'm going to Florida, there's any, like, a room or a spare, a spare bed or anything that I can leave and rest my bones for a little bit, for at least a month, so I can get my things going on, find a job, and say, okay. <laughs> when I came, I came to Deerfield Beach here in Florida. But wait, what is the reason why you moved to Florida? Oh, Okay. Yeah, I, the reason I used to move to Florida because I was young and stupid. I used to make a lot of mistakes. Used to, I was totally immature, totally irresponsible. I used to owe people money. Uh, I was actually I was very lazy in doing construction because I hated something that is uh, that I didn't like to wake up in the morning with that cold weather and go to work. I was very lazy. And I wasn't. I didn't have enough knowledge about finances, and I was spending my money like crazy. I used to owe people. I was going to a little depression. I broke up with my girlfriend, and I didn't even mention to her that I was coming. I was coming to Florida. When I got here, that's what you were trying me to. You were. Yeah. So basically, you're having a hard time there. Emotionally, financially, because of your own irresponsibility for being young and immature. And then you had this situation with your girlfriend. And you also didn't like the cold, right? You hated the weather in Boston. Because we are from a tropical country where we're not used to snow. <laughs> we're not used to cold. And you had a hard time adapting there, right? Yeah, actually everything was my fault. And I take all the accountability for it. And that, that helped me to grow and I hated that cold weather. I broke with my uh, lovely, lovely girlfriend. Your first love, my right? My first love <laughs> and I had a bro broken heart. I was broke in money. I used to owe people and people was after me trying to uh, receive their money. And I came to Flor Florida still owning these people's money. It just wanted a fresh start, right? Well, I wanted a fresh start. I couldn't breathe over there. Everything was my fault. And once you, you take a responsibility for your uh, all the mistakes, everything that has hap happened to you, you start growing. Exactly. Why are you blaming someone else for your results? For like, results. oh, it's their fault. It's my boss's fault. It's my brother's fault. And if you're not taking responsibility, you don't think you don't take that ownership, right? And then you don't know, you don't realize that was you, and then you don't take an action to, to correct to that correct behavior. correct and become someone better. Or that whatever you're doing that is wrong. And do you want to talk about how changing your geography and moving far away from certain people, people and situations, how did this completely change your life and your results? I truly encourage every single people, person that is, is living a toxic life with a uh, family members or friends, those toxic, toxic, toxic cycles won't take you anywhere. You need to change uh, the, the people that surrounds you. You need to change even uh, geographically like I did. It did help me to give me, myself, an opportunity to restart everything over again. I came to Florida and I promised myself I wouldn't be uh, the 
an irresponsible person again. I would do everything I could to become someone better. And all the irresponsibility that uh, was happening in my life was my fault. And actually, it had a consequence and hurt every single person around me. It wasn't only myself. It was my family. It was a really good people, friends, even my ex-girlfriend. They suffer because of your own errors and mistakes that Correct. you make. You when make people that, are, that love you. They also have to handle the consequences of whatever you did. Whatever you did. And I think it's important to mention, see, the listening to Tico talking, the first thing was like taking ownership and admitting like I messed up. I was the one to blame, but I want to change. But I think you shared with me a couple of times how you couldn't change because you're so involved in that mm -hmm. environment that you couldn't see a way out. You couldn't see a way to do things differently and changing your location and moving away from that toxicity, toxicity, not meaning that the, they were the ones to blame. You were the one to blame because you're choosing to be around people you shouldn't. You're choosing to be with friends that were partying or doing things that were not really productive for your life. You're choosing to party really hard that night before and not come to, to work, work the next day. I, and I then used to do that a lot. Being fired and then you choose not to do things you have to do. But then when you moved and you were away mm -hmm. from all that kind of um, addictive routine and behaviors, that's when you started changing your results. I encourage every single one that move out of the cycle and the people that are surround you, the city that you live in, the family, just leave everything behind and take a new step towards the your future, towards the dreams that you want to achieve. And everything will start, uh, new doors will start open for you. Believe in that. And, and I, I think the fact that you had your brothers, he gave you that sense that it doesn't protection. matter how much I mess up, I can go and call my brother, he's going to help me. If I that, don't that pay the rent, um, I call my brother and he'll figure it out. They will loan me your money. Yeah. And then you're creating all these crazy situations where you're asking people for help. It was your own responsibility that you're immature and you didn't, you made bad choices. And then when you moved here, you had no support. You're by yourself. By so myself. you had to learn how to was be an adult. When I came to Florida, was an, I was trying to escape from people that I owe money, from all the, the pressure that I had, the cold. And I never had see the way out. I was thinking constantly. And I never see the op a new opportunity. And this was an opportunity for me. But I need to realize that myself. Correct. If I kept doing the same thing I was doing, I would I would be the same person, always. And would, as you mentioned to me, I one would have time, the same results. Yes, that you you would say to yourself, okay, I'm not gonna go party, I'm not gonna go drink, I'm not gonna spend my money on this. But then a friend call, hey Tico, this party, blah 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 blah. Whoever's gonna be there, I'm picking you up. Be ready. He couldn't say no. So it was hard for you. To, you you made a decision, but then whatever happens, a call or something, you like it was okay, stronger than me. It was stronger than so, you. So, but what happened with me? Yeah, in Boston was all my responsibility. I take that on a ship. My friends used to call me. Yeah, let's go to this uh, club tonight. But next day, I had to work, and I I make the decision to go to club, and when I come like really really late in the in late hours, and I had to work like five or six in the morning, I couldn't wake up. Mm -hmm. And what happened is I couldn't wake up. I missed the uh, the alarm, and I didn't show up for work, and my, my boss used to just uh, fire me. So I, I was fired, fired from many, many jobs. And then when I come to Florida, I didn't stop partying, but at least I took ownership of... Uh, Everything that was happening in Boston, I didn't want to happen here. So I was paying my bills on time. I was working hard. I didn't miss a day to work. I, if I, I remember times, I'm going back there in this place that I used to work and how I, when I come here to Florida. But I remember a time that I would go here in Florida, is straight from club to work. And I was drinking at the place, drinking 
alcohol at the place to keep me moving. Because Even at work, you at drink work. at work during business hours. During business hours, so but I didn't miss that that work. So if I lo lose that job, I wouldn't lose the opportunity of my life, and I would uh, I didn't. I didn't want to repeat everything I was doing in Boston. So when I came to Florida, my uh, cousin gave me a uh, shelter. And the place that he used to, was a salon. It was a unisex salon. And my, my, my cousin said, oh, this place, I asked the, uh, the manager. She said, they need someone. They need a barber that actually. And he took me there. I talked to the, to the lady. And I start next week, a, a week after. You know, I think I th I don't remember the day, but she gave me the opportunity there, and there was a Winnie Sex Salon, and I had the opportunity to be able to learn how to cut women's hair. You know, I, I was introduced to not only barbering but the, the cosmetology, like the head hairdressing life. So that gave me actually a power because as a barber, if you learn how to handle long hairs and deal with different people and male and women that gave me a lot of skills actually soft skills and, and hard skills and she gave me the opportunity I started work a week after after that and I was very young I think I was 23 back then can you make the, the calculation so I'm 38 2008 I don't know. <laughs> help me you don't know your age <laughs> no when I came in 2000 I, 2008 I was 23 I believe eight I, yeah. I don't know. I came at, at the end of the year in 2008. I started working this place. It was a Brazilian uh, salon. You're 24. Okay. Because you're six old years older than me. Okay. You're 24. I'm, I, wor I was 24 years old. Thank God I was blessed because they gave me this opportunity. Uh, in the first year, they make you to work seven days because the opportunity they gave it to you, you work seven days, but you also give opportunity for the older ones take a day off or two so basically so, you had to work with no days off no days for off a year. yeah for a year you know and That's crazy. i had to be <laughs> through there and the 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 price of the haircut was only i think it was 15 it was 15 dollars and i was work out of commission i was making 60 percent out of the haircut i was out of 15 i was making nine dollars per haircut i used to take one hour wow Woo. i didn't remember that didn't recall that now so i was making nine dollars an hour uh for almost a year since and then I, can I you good. talk about when you moved to florida it was during the greatest recession oh, yeah. of 2008 and it was crazy difficult yeah uh the first year since i didn't have um any clients i was building my clientele it was very tough i was making nine nine dollar an hour because i was very slower cutter a barber and i was learning also how to handle and and blow dry and do all the the dyeing the colors in women's hair and do all those chemicals like brazilian keratin all that stuff relaxing and it was in 2008 the uh the crisis 2008 crisis when uh, obama took over after bush right uh, not because of obama or anything it's just because all that stuff was happening in 2008 you know what happened the country was going broke. It was a real estate crisis, right? Country was going broke. People losing People their houses. People was losing their homes, or cars. Americans they used to have like four or five cars in a the garage. They dropped to one or two, maybe. Mm -hmm. People used to waste water, waste stuff, uh, buying extra stuff, and just throw it away. People used to now think over and think twice before they do that. All my clients back then was Brazilians. In Brazil, we are here in another country trying to survive, and the country was broke. And all my clients used to, hey, Tico, I'm going back to Brazil, man, next month. I used to serve people back then in that year, even next year in 2009, because it took around two years and a half to three years to the country recover. Excuse me, guys. So the country recover, and uh, all my, my, I served people that I cut only once that year because they were going new back clients to they were going back to brazil because most of my my clientele was brazilian because mm -hmm. the place was brazilian i was i didn't know better mm -hmm. and you want me to share anything else more no i'm just uh thinking that um 
at that time, Brazil was doing good. The economy in Brazil was getting better. So since things got difficult for the Brazilian immigrants here, they decided that it was better to go back to Brazil because things were tough here. And the, the things that they accomplished here, maybe they bought houses, they, you know, built a life. They saw everything... You know, they in, they in lost, country, yeah. so they decided that it was better to go to go Brazil. Back. And at that period of time, a lot of Brazilians went back to Brazil because the situation here was really tough. Really tough. Yep. And for me, remember, I just moved from another state. So everything was new, no clientele, no money in a country. So it was very challenging. And I wasn't a professional, like meaning that, wow, it was years experience. I wasn't... Um, a barber that didn't respect ma much the the culture of the I, I was someone very uh I never I wasn't never a person to hurt people or like to do bad with people uh, making bad uh people feel bad or anything but it was for myself I didn't understand myself I was uh, I was coming late every time to work I was dressing I wasn't dressing properly you know the the manager she used to all the time call me on a corner and say Tico you can't wear those pants and I say why <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, had no idea. I had no idea but we did ha had not a dress code but we did had a t-shirt that they make and gave us like three t-shirt used to give us those t-shirts sometimes I forgot the t-shirt sometimes I used to dress just put another t-shirt and go to work and say where's your t-shirt and that happened and back then I was an employee and I didn't see it. But now as a business owner, I understand why she was doing and asking me and trying to guide me. Thanks <laughs> God, she has so, ma so she, much she patience, patience with, with you. <laughs> and you know? she's actually still your friend. And she's and still my friend Tico nowadays. She says, oh my God, how you could handle me. <laughs> and you know what? I was so immature and didn't understand much about life. And I used to get mad. She called me on a corner and said, Tico, is that a not, not a, a proper uh, pants? My prints was all ripped off and no pockets ripped off in the front. You know, it was a, like a trend back then. <laughs> and I didn't understand. I used to get mad at her. So, boy, now as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, we are, now I understand why she was doing what she's doing, right? I worked in this place for over three years. And I wanted something else. I wanna, I wasn't making enough money, actually. Uh, for a year, I was making less than three hundred dollars there. For a year, over a year, I started bu building up my clientele. Three hundred a week, you mean? Yeah, right? three hundred, three hundred dollar a week. Okay. And I'm a very sociable person. I make made a lot of friends, a lot of connections, a lot of people that used to cut the hell with me. Nowadays, they still cut the hell, and they became really good friends. Pe people that I, I go to their house, I I sit on their table. So I worked with that uh, for. Three, over three years and then I, I knew this guy that he was working a very very fancy salon salon was built uh, the cost to build the salon was over a million dollar and he said why don't you you're going to be the first and only barber there why don't you try it? and ask the owner I remember it was uh, Jody Jack Jody I spoke to Jody Jack and uh, she gave me the opportunity to become a barber there but when I get there I was the only barber but also I was taking women's you know, and then since the price, oh, I remember this, since the price of the salon, they were charging, I think, was $65 for haircut, per haircut, right? And the salon that I was working was 15 for men's haircut. And all my clients, I lost all, I was lo losing, losing? Mm -hmm. I was losing all my clients because they couldn't go and couldn't afford or they don't want, or they didn't see value or whatever. They, was, they wasn't going to the place I was working. And then I started only do uh, women's haircuts and style and all that stuff. So but it was like starting all over again, all, again. All over again, because again. Because you lost the old clients. Uh-huh. Uh, since I noticed I was losing my, uh, my old clients, I built, I used to live in a townhouse with an ex-girlfriend, so <laughs> an ex, uh, ex-girlfriend and we had a garage. We live in a townhouse, we had a garage and I, I got the amazing idea. 
I built a garage. I built a barbershop in our garage. I put a sink. I hired, not hired. I had this uh, amazing guy. He has a uh, plumbing company, Julio. No, what's it? Julio. Uh, Julio. Julio do. Okay. By the Matt, Julio Matz, Yep. And amazing guy. He helped me so much. Thank he you, Julio. Shout out to you. you. <laughs> he built the sink. Thank you very much. He built a sink for me over there in my garage. I put a little sofa, I put a small fridge with the alcohol, uh, whiskey, vodka, and all that stuff. And I was taking care of all my clients after the salon, the American salon that I was working after five in my garage, all the only men's. At what a time, was your at a time. idea at the time? Why did you do that? Because you didn't want to lose the clients you're serving? I, First was because I didn't, all my clients was calling me, why, what happened, man? You disappeared. And I was very irresponsible still, you know. Uh, I was taking clients in, in my notebook agenda and still. I didn't take, uh, I never, I wasn't good with responding back to my clients and all that. And I started losing clients. That was the first idea because I started losing, so now I don't want to lose those clients. I don't want to make an extra money. Since I started working in new, this new place, I don't have clients. It was very fancy salon, and I work. I used to work from eight to five in this American salon, and after five, I used to work with only men in our in garage. garage until one in the morning, uh, midnight, and I started having. And actually, after a year doing that, I quit the American salon in Boca Raton, and I was doing only my garage. And but that became a problem because I lost my. I was working from home was working in my garage. I lost my freedom, and people w was using the bathroom over there where my wife, uh, only one bathroom. So it wasn't very properly placed to work, and I noticed that. I was making a good money. I built up. Actually, I, creating, I, I, I kept building clientele in my garage and created a bigger problem because I didn't have a, a extra parking spot. Yeah. And uh, the neighbors started calling the police. They started... Uh, what what's happening? There was a party here every day, so and then I had the 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 thought that I, I should find a place to work, and then I found this small place to work in Deerfield Beach that I was working for two years. Uh, I was renting a chair. I quit the garage, and all my clients came to me, and not all of them, but yeah, a few of my clients came to me, but I had. Both. I used to have. still have women's. I still have men's. But the men's was less, actually. But we're serving the female clients in your garage as well? Few of them. You know, few of them. And I started losing a lot of them because they didn't want to go to the, to the, the garage. To the and garage. then you had wasn't men coming. And then was this mix of people, right? Men, female, male. Yeah. It wasn't very professional. They go... Plus no privacy in your home. Actually, it doesn't get, give you any credibility, too, working mm -hmm. from home, working from a garage. And they I don't see that. you as a professional, mm -hmm. right? Even they, they ask for... Discounts. They don't want to pay they the ask full for price. Discount. Yep. They question, like, why are you charging the same price as a, uh, salon, as a salon if it's in your garage? Yep. You have to deal with a couple problems when you're doing from your own home. Yep. And I started working at this place. The lady was charging me. I believe it was... Uh, I don't know. I, was, uh, I, I I forgot how much she was charging me. You're renting uh, the chair, right? I was renting the chair. She used to rent spots there. She used to rent another chair for the woman. She was a hairdresser. And the other rooms, she was char charging separately like a suite, right? Mm -hmm. And since But I, you was a female salon, right? It was a female salon. I was the only barber. I had to buy the chair. I oh, know I had the chair. Actually, I had to buy another chair. That chair wasn't wasn't working well. So I had to had buy to another buy chair. Barber chair barber because chair. she only had hairdressing chairs, right? Hairdressing chair. And the one that I had... On the, oh, wasn't <laughs> was a crap. <laughs> it was a very cheap one. Um, and why did you go there? Why did you choose that place, knowing it was a female hair salon? What was your thought? I don't recall that because I just wanted to. You didn't plan. This. I didn't plan. <laughs> you know, there was a. I had the, a little bit of men's, a little bit of women's, so I can't survive. That's my f first thought. Mm -hmm. And I like quiet place, but it didn't have enough parking space actually. And I started working there, rent the chair, worked there for over four years or two years. No, two years, over two years. And that when I, I, I get was, um, since I have lots of women, lots of guys, and that time was in 2000, already 
2009, 2010, 2011. It was end of 2010, 2000, beginning of 2011. I decided to just, just cut men's hair, you know, bec become a barber. And I call all the girls and I call, hey, I'm not cutting women's hair anymore. You, you should find another hairdresser. And they were crying. They were cussing, <laughs> <laughs> cursing me and saying, you can't ever do that. You can't you, leave me. You're the me. best. You can't leave me. I say, I'm going to do your hair once, once more. You're going to have the time after that to find another person. You but there's love one me. thing, though, that you actually had a fiancé at the time. And you motivated her to go to school and become a cosmetologist. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know your story better than you. <laughs> Because she used to <laughs> do her, her own, own uh, blow dry. You know, she used to do really well. And look, like, you could do, do that, you know. I think you have that. And then you're actually the gift. motivator for, the supporter for her to become a hairdresser and... Even though I don't know her personally, I know people that nowadays do the hair with her and they love how good she is. Yeah, we have friends that do uh, her, her hair with her, their, their hair with her. And she didn't love the, the work that she was doing. She was proud, wasn't proud of it. She was tired of it. And why don't you take on a first step? And actually, she didn't go to school at first or get the license in the school yeah. at first. I But had, you taught I her, knew, right? I taught her many things, but... Then after that, I start working and all that stuff in this new place. Everything changed, and I had I knew this person. She has an, an a salon, and I call her and say, "Can you give my fiance it was a fiance back then, uh, another one <laughs> was a fiance back then?" And and can you give? I asked my friend if she could, she could give her an opportunity, and she said yes. And then she kept growing. She kept learning from this. And she this, became a great hairdresser. A great hairdresser. Yeah. So thanks to your support, your you know, you motivated her to follow this career. To follow this career. And you actually send your your female clients to her. Like, okay, I'm not doing your hair anymore. I was referring to her. But yes. Go to her. She do a great job. I I remember that. Wow, you remember better than me. Yeah. I refer all I my, know your whole story. All you my told ladies me to her. All my hair, uh, my clients, women to her. And then you're doing just men. I will, and then I started just being a barber, cutting men, but I didn't have uh, enough men to pay the chair, my rent, and I had this car that I was paying off tons of money <laughs> in in uh, in finance. I financed. It. I was paying a thousand dollar a month for, for wow, car. for the car, and I didn't have. I say wow. If I don't have the income from the woman's, what should I do now? So I came up with the idea that, with a strategy that every single man, every single client of mine that came to my chair, I was offering them, like, if you bring one client, one one client to me, your head, but you, you guys have to come together. Did I tell you that? Mm -hmm. You guys have to come together. Bring a new client, your haircut will be for free. And for one week, I was slammed. I was so booked that week. And then I kept doing that for months. And then I became booked. I didn't have to do that in, uh, anymore. I worked in that place for, it was a great strategy, right? Yeah, <laughs> it was. I'm not saying you guys should do that, but sometimes you have to do what you have to do, you know? Yeah. And I could because I, w I was renting a chair and I had the power, I had the freedom to do that. Mm -hmm. So... I was I worked there for two years from 2011 to 2013, 13. and then I moved to other salon that I was only hairdressers too. Was a you not was but a unisex salon. Why did you was, move to from that place to the next place? I don't recall that. What, I, don't I recall. <laughs> you don't know. She, she know. Why did I move? From you the, don't remember? It's reason. because over there it was mostly oh. a female hair salon. And you're bringing all the guys, and the guys oh, yeah. were creating problems there. Meaning, they yeah, would yeah. make the female clients from the other people that work in that place feel uncomfortable with, with whatever they were talking. It was talking, very man thing. It was whatever. very small salon. salon. It was very small. So everything my clients was talking, uh, whatever they were saying, they were very. Uh, Or maybe Fe they, flirting, they didn't have flirting with, with the, the clients, with the, the client, female clients, the female clients, <laughs> and they didn't filter what men's, you know, most of them, they didn't filter what to say. And, and then, I think that's when you realize that okay, it's not a good strategy mixing both worlds in the same space in a very small space. I want to get to there. Okay. <laughs> so the 
Uh, and then I start feel uncomfortable. My clients was uncomfortable because there was a lot of women there. The, my boss was uncomfortable. He used to call me and say, Tico, that's not working because all your clients, they're talking too loud. And they saying things that is not properly for all these ladies with the kids sometimes around. And I say, I had to find some place to work and another place to work so my clients be more comfortable. Even though that didn't happen because then the place that I used to, the place that I moved to it was a hair salon. <laughs> and I was the only barber. Used to be a mess because I wasn't organized. I used to book my client in uh, my notebook, calling text message throughout social media. I was crazy and unorganized. And the same problem was happening. And all my clients used to sit around, talk loud. And this place was an American salon as well. And I had a, a good friend working with me. He used to do women's hair. I was the only barber. I was renting a chair. My barbers used, to, my my clients used to do the same mess, and they only used to complain. All the hairdressers used to complain. Tico, can you make your clients like talk less louder? Yeah, we're Brazilians. We're louder. We're loud. <laughs> we we know how to be really loud. <laughs> really loud. I was still partying. I was still uh, not responsible at all with money. You know, I was spending my money. I was partying a lot. No clue of my future. No planning my future. Nothing of that. So no perspective, actually. And I met you in 2013. 13. End the, of 2013. End in 2013. You're still in this place. And I remember that your chair was kind of isolated from everybody else. I think because you're creating all these problems to the other hairdressers. So you're right there in the last chair by yourself, trying Actually, to have your own space. Own sp I was the last chair, so I couldn't make too much noise. And I would get there and then Tico had... I met you in the first week that, that I you moved, moved there. Uh -huh. You don't know, but I, you don't remember, but I remember. I met you in the first week that, that I was there. They just moved there. Yeah. Then Tico had one client in the chair, three others Waiting. surrounding and talking and being mm. loud, just there, like watching him cut. And then five other in the waiting area and three outside. And it was just crazy. And people <laughs> calling me and texting me. It was a mess. Me. It was a big mess. It was a big mess. I was renting the chair there. I remember it was in the first week. And I worked there for four years, and me and you, we still were partying, and we were still... Yeah, four years. But then I think uh, that's the, the important thing to talk about this year, is that during these transitions that you made, that's when you found out that mixing both, both clients were, was not a good idea, right? Mixing both worlds... Because then your male clients... You're taking away the freedom of the, the guys or even the salon, the women, to talk and be relaxed and be more comfortable. You take Correct. that comf comf comfortable? <laughs> you make them uncomfortable. You make them uncomfortable. And so. also for the other hairdressers, you're creating issues. And I remember that when we first met... Uh, right in the beginning, you told me about your dream and then you described me the barber shop that you wanted to have and then everything every little single detail that you described that's how invictus is nowadays but at that time you were broke i was broke we just met and then you had this amazing dream that was not possible at all. This very upscale barber shop, just for men, like a man cave with hot towel shaves, with pool table and serving drinks and having a tattoo shop and having this and that and this. modern barbershop. It didn't have the that kind of barbershop, that model yeah. back then. And then you're talking about all these details about how the barber shop would be and i was like this guy's crazy this is gonna cost a million dollars he's just crazy and at the time like you're you owe your credit card you owe your car we're sharing the uh, we had a roommate to share everything the expenses because as soon as we met <laughs> one month after we're living together right <laughs> And then we're so broke. I owed my previous roommate money. 
like you you <laughs> it was just let, crazy let me just repeat everything she said because she said everything i wanted to say so oh i'm sorry i tell I, your version of the my story version now. of the story i met her first month uh we were living together i was broke i used to own a bmw a lot of money i was paying a huge uh finance huge huge money for that car the car was like br breaking Every down week. every time, every week, <laughs> and she used to owe money her, her roommate. I didn't. I was living week, weekly by week, week by week, like making paycheck money this week, paycheck. paycheck by paycheck, making money this week, spend all the money, make money next week, spend all, spend all the money. No clue of future, right? And you, then, you didn't even know like if you had money to pay for your gas the following the week. The following week. And or I food. remember that Tico would stop at the gas station and put ten dollars gas. I was like, Why did you put only ten dollars gas? Why don't you fill your tank? You know, you're gonna <laughs> use the whole week. It doesn't make any sense. Or he would put five dollars. I was like, What the heck? Just to get home. Because he had no money. He spent all the money. He spent all the money. So irresponsible. And I told my wife uh, about the dream. Of course, I, as a barber, we have the dream of have our our own shop one day. I believe that many barbers, maybe 98% of 99% of barbers, has the same dream. I told her about my dream. I wanted something. Uh, I wanted something modern. I wanted some a place that the modern man could go, and not only get a haircut and beard, but go there, relax, drinking a coffee, beer. Uh, making a, uh, a tattoo, you know, having a place and be comfortable around men only, you know, because since I noticed that it doesn't work out, women's and men's in the same place. So I told her about my dream at first. She ignored. She wasn't, uh, she didn't embrace, right? She wasn't like very, uh, uh, what's the name? Supportive. Ex sec sec uh, skeptical. Skeptical. Yeah. She was very skeptical. I thought he was crazy. I thought it was, it was crazy. We didn't have none, zero money. Why? How are we going to build this barbershop the way you mentioned? Because yeah. I was dreaming, you know, and I actually I had the opportunity. I saw the opportunity in her, meaning that, wow, this woman could help me in the first month. I, I was, was like, living with a minimum wage, and I was very organized, even though I was I owed my roommate at the time. Uh, because of circumstances that happened and I couldn't afford some e some issues that I had here. And then um, I was very organized, living with minimum wage, but I still was able to pay all my bills, very organized. And I think you saw that in me, like, oh, she's very organized with her stuff. You were right? paying all your bills. And you're making car. three, four times more a week than I was doing, and you still had zero money in your account. <laughs> <laughs> so you saw you saw the opportunity, right? I saw the opportunity and you're like this woman, she's so smart. She could help me. And I was thinking and I was telling her about the ideas. I actually I was inviting her to my dream. Right? But it didn't work. It didn't work. She was, was skeptical. Like, no. She was no, I'm you're not gonna crazy. help. If I help you, you're gonna leave me. We we don't have the money. And then uh a we're share. so young and immature. Oh we're so young, so young. We were traveling. All the money that we had, we were uh, partying. spending, partying, food. Every yeah. weekend, we were like fully booked with stuff, like meaning traveling to another city here, doing parties and restaurants. Birth restaurants. We were spending. expending the money like this. Yep. With things that weren't really helping build our future. So months passed by. Uh, she Years. Was years? Yep. Was years, right? So, oh yeah, four years passed by. No, it was before four because four. That's when we opened the yeah, shop. Yeah, when we opened the shop. So yeah. about two so years later. Two years later, you after uh, I met you. After you met me, yeah. we were living together already. Already, mm -hmm. and when I met you, I moved. You moved together with me. I was living with my your friend, my co-worker. He was my friend, and then months, you we moved it together by ourselves, right? Yeah, so we're living with him for a while, and then it didn't work out, a couple living with someone else, and then... We want our freedom, we want to yeah. do our own thing. Then we moved to another apartment, just the two of us. In the same community. And then um, one day, after about two years that I met Tico, a person from my city, he knows my parents, he's older than me, he's about my, my parents' age, or a little younger, 
I'll be younger than them. But they know my parents. And for whatever reason, I believe in God. So I believe it was meant to be. Uh, I was invited to go to his house by another friend to have dinner. And Tico couldn't go that night. I think he was working. I don't remember. Probably you're working. 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 And then I went with this friend to this person's house. And then we're there just having dinner, eating pizza. And then he was out of nowhere started talking about his life story. He's a very successful businessman. He's, you know, financial wise, he's very rich. And then he used to live in my city. He knows my parents. And he was talking about how his wife was so important in his uh, success as, a, as financial success because when they got married, she was pregnant and he had a job, a stable job, let's say a nine to five job. And he was making money enough for them to have a life. And he had another opportunity that could make him rich. But this opportunity was so risky. So he decided, I'll go, I'll talk to my wife. And whatever she tells me, that's what I'm going to do. If she support me, I'll quit my job and jump in the opportunity. If she says no, I will stay with my job because then we're secure there. And he was expecting she would say, you're crazy. I'm pregnant. You want to quit your job for something you don't know if it's going to work? That was his expectation. But then when he got home and told her about the opportunity, she said, I'm with you no matter what. Whatever you decide, I will support you. And this changed their life forever. He became really rich. He was able to have a whole different new life after the support of his wife to make the right decision. And then he mentioned to me, your husband is so, so, so talented. Why don't you be that person for him and support him? You have nothing to lose. What is the worst that can happen? That was the question. Like, what is the worst that can happen? And then I was like, yeah. You guys have nothing. <laughs> yeah, you have no mortgage. Yeah, you no have living. no kids. You have no nothing. Like, if everything goes wrong, he's still a barber. He can rent a chair another, in another place and start over. And you can find a job for yourself. And I was like, yeah. He you can go back to the same shop. Yeah. You have the clients. Like, what is the worst, worst that could happen? So why not try? And he said, maybe he just need your support. Maybe he just need you to be there for him. And that night I told Tico, you know what? She came home. She you told You know me. the dream you have. I'm with you now. We're going to make it happen. And then we start saving money. And we're saving the most we could for about two years, right? Yes. And two, I wasn't ready, but then Tico was ready. I was ready anytime. <laughs> we Tell didn't the have story. the money, enough money, actually. No, let's just start with the fact that what do you mean we didn't have enough money? We didn't know how much money, how money we needed. Yeah, much there was no planning. There was no budgeting. There was no nothing. It was just like, okay, let's save the money. <laughs> and I was saving. Let's save, let's save, let's save. But we had no plan no action plan no budget no nothing nothing so you're just uh like saving the money and i think it, it is in god's how god's will is said uh my client he was my client since he was 15 one day he became a realtor and i supported him with uh positive words because he asked me what what i what, I, what was my thought in him become a realtor? Say that's a great opportunity now in uh, being, being, you know, the market for realtors is huge. So you can be rich, you can ver be very successful, keep it up doing it. And he did the course and all these years he, he started working. And one day, since we, we are saving the money for the barbershop, actually be, behind the chair, you have this conversation with your clients and i mentioned to him yeah i do want to uh, open my own shop one day i'm a barber every single barber almost every single barber has this dream i mentioned it to to him long time ago and i was having a lunch uh with you at the restaurant and he texted me or called me i don't re recall that i don't remember that actually and hey tico i found a place for you you want to check it out I say, I'm not even looking for, but, and he said, you, I remember you mentioned that this is a, an opportunity. And he told me where, and I say, oh, no, that plaza is very expensive. That plaza is dead. And he said, no, a new owner, he bought the plaza. 
and he's rich. He owns half of Florida, means he owns a lot of properties. And he bought the plaza, he started rebuilding, renewing the plaza, and he said, this is a great opportunity because this owner, what he does is he buy the plaza and he does all this uh, renovation, he starts to bring new tenants. And I say, I told my wife, and she say, let's take a look. And was the first place we take a look, right? Oh no, before there, I had mentioned to one of really good friend of mine that I, uh, I want to open a barbershop, and he said, he was a, he showed he, us a couple places. Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't a beginner realtor too. Correct. I wanted to help him. He was going to help me, and he showed me a couple of places. But we didn't like it. We right? didn't like it. He was very discouraging because he didn't have enough experience, and and but that's fine. And then he, Daniel, Daniel Ribeiro, he he showed us that place. That place was the first one, right, with Daniel. Was the first one. He didn't show Actually, us anything. Actually, you didn't give me opportunity. You <laughs> just said that's the place because I, <laughs> I think you that. saw with Daniel before you told me, and then you just came and said that's the place. No, I saw f- you through the throughout yeah, through the window. Through the window, but you're so like that's the place. You didn't give me any option to choose anything. <laughs> you're just actually, like that's actually, the place. Actually, you 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 hint about it like meaning no. Let's try to find I wasn't, another. I wasn't ready. Yeah, we wasn't ready. I was like, okay, I was not expecting that. You come, you found the place, and I have to sign the contract. What are you talking about? No I'm not planning. ready. Yeah, we did have no planning. No, we, I had no, no idea. No business how, plan. How nothing. much money we need cost. to build the place, or licenses, or permits, or whatever. And then when it, when we thought uh, dealing the the contract for the place, right? And you you're tough always, and the, then you start dealing, making the deal with the yeah. uh, owner, and what well, have you explained better? How so, was the deal that day? That's yeah. the thing. Um, I had no experience prior, like renting a commercial place. So I don't remember, but I think Daniel told me you should uh, have a lawyer reviewing all the all the lease agreement. And the lease had like 60 pages. A very complex leasing agreement. And then I think he referred me to this lawyer. Yeah. And then we went there and then he reviewed every little single clause he read to me and he explained what it means. He, it cost us a nine hundred to a thousand dollar. I don't remember the cost. I remember exactly. The cost. Uh Uh-huh. But it was actually the best investment Mm -hmm. because then he highlighted everything that was like, this is not good for you. This is good for your landlord. But if this happened, you you know? So he gave me all the instructions and the negotiations were tough because then I was asking for things that the landlord didn't want to give us. And that plaza was completely abandoned for real. He just bought it. It was empty. It was so dead. It was only the post office, the La Brasa, and, and the, the gym. And the gym. Correct. Nobody else. So it was completely empty. And then uh, your friend told you, Tico, don't rent that place. Like you're Not Daniel. Those you're are not other gonna, friends. You're not going to make it. You're not going to have that, walk-ins. That place this is place dead. is dead. That place is a terrible location. I think it was God so, because we had no experience, but you're so decided that you wanted that place. It was meant to be, I believe. Right? And after months of negotiation, maybe five months or something, we decided to, okay, let's do it. That's the place. The landlord accepted some of our conditions, and one of them was to have a tattoo uh, a tattoo service there, be, being able to have a tattoo artist in our space. And then we signed and then we're like, okay, great. What do we do now, right? And when we signed the contract, um, <laughs> one third of the money <laughs> was just for the deposits. So whatever was left, we could afford buying the chairs, and the money was gone. Yeah, because Some we had no materials, paint, maybe, but <laughs> then the money was gone. And um, crazy things happen after that because, for for example, the painting. Someone gave it to me, the whole painting. I mean, the the the, the, the labor. Wh- no, he gave me everything, they even gave the, the material. I don't remember that. Yes, gave you the I machine. didn't pay one dime. Wow. He gave it to me, and he's not a friend. He's not a person I. I've you knew before. I was just doing something for him, a side job, and then he's like, "I'll I'll do it for you." I say, "Okay, give me an estimate." He's no, I'll give it to you. I say, okay, what do you mean you give it to me? He's like, yeah, you're not going to pay anything. I said, but you're charging me the materials at least? He's like, nope. He paid all out of his pocket, everything, the whole painting job. 
and we had help of friends, right? Your clients that were there. I never understood how how much you're younger, young, and deal with all that stuff with no previous experience. like background of business person, your family or anything, yeah. and that much experience. Especially so, in a different country because I'm mm -hmm. not from here, right? Yeah, it was tough for us too because you make the whole deal with the landlord. Yeah. Actually, she ha uh, she have him drop how much we were going to pay in a contract, right? Yeah, the, it was a rent. tough negotiation, Sorry. and he only gave us two you years. You extract a lot from him yeah. back then. You, you were so young. You how? don't know how, how, right? No. And then he only gave us two years because we were so young, and we had never had a business. No like history that he could actually trust us, uh -huh. that we would make it. And one thing that is very interesting is that nowadays we hear from his office staff how proud he is and how much he likes our barbershop because when he drive by, he see how beautiful it is, how big it became, and he just like proud of us because actually he didn't believe in us. We're so young and unexperienced. One day he mentioned that he has eight thousand properties he in South Florida and throughout everything he has. Yeah. So going back, um, I, 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 it's amazing what you what you have done with I so don't know. less it's so God the minimum experience that you had you you had. So you no extract from him the floor. Because we couldn't afford the floor and also he gave it to us the floor, right? Yes. The, the he, he installed the floor. He installed the floor. He has uh, uh, all the floor material in his warehouse. He gave it to us. Correct. Too, yeah. And then he installed the floor. And there's other things that I asked him to do. And the big deal was the tattoo. He didn't want to accept. But at the end, he's like, okay, whatever. He accepted the tattoo condition. There is a clause there saying we can have tattoo. But we're going to talk about the tattoo later. Because later. then there was other problems yeah. with the tattoo. And then um, remember the deal when we were dealing, we had to meet him at his office and I was w wearing flip flops and shorts. Oh. You don't remember that? Chico. <laughs> the day I think we finally signed the lease, he was there in person because, of course, we're dealing with his staff, not with him personally. We didn't have much credibility of anything. Chico comes wearing flip flops and then he's like... <laughs> <laughs> shorts and flip flops. It was so funny. It was funny. And How you look this at guy us, would trust two you? Two young people. Uh, the, the, and the no guy wearing flip flops. I was 27. You were 33, right? 33 already. But we we're so immature, so young, so inexperienced. And then. Um, we start building the place. We had a lot of help from. Many friends, like I said, once you're a barber, you connect with people, you meet people, you make friendship, you you know. And so many people helped, helped you for us. free. And thank you every single one of you that helped us to build our shop. If it wasn't from you guys, we wouldn't have amazing shop. Actually, we didn't have everything we have today. Because you guys was the, f the people that believed in us. And man, most of you guys, not most, everybody that gave us their work their hard work for free. And the They're thing was friends. that you would still work during the day, right? As a barber at the place you're working. And I we would come at night and yeah. kind of do things Since we on. didn't have all the money, we, we didn't plan or anything, <laughs> no plan at all. Yeah. I still was working at the same place until like 7 p.m., maybe 8, 9. After, and, and my wife was working at her place. You know, selling granite, I think. Was yeah. that was that right? I was selling granite and cabinets. And cabinets. And uh, we went there after hours and started building the shop. And we were dead tired, right? Yep. Working. And we did maybe... 80 percent of the work ourselves with the help of friends all the friends like hanging mirrors in the wall and doing doing all the stations the granite the, the cabinets uh even if i don't know how to do cabinets and all the stuff my friend was helping me and i was helping him you know i couldn't afford paying someone and i you couldn't afford let the him helper <laughs> bring yeah i was the helper and i had pictures to prove yeah so it was that putting everything and helping to paint and do all that stuff our and one own. thing that i want to mention that it's a very important message if you're watching is that sometimes you do have a dream you do have something you want to build in life but you're just dreaming and when you start taking action 
God start aligning all the help you need, all the help right? You need. How yeah. many people jumped in your project, in our project, because now it's my project too, because I, you know, embraced Tico's dream. And then God started bringing the people. How come this guy that works with painting, he was not my friend, out of nowhere, he's like, I'm giving it to you. I'll do it for free. Like, why? Because I want to do it. So God started aligning the people, the resources, and everything we needed to make that happen. But it only happened because you took action and you gave the first step. Once you start moving, uh, everything starts happening. You know, exactly. So if you're just dreaming how I'm going to make this happen, of course, planning helps because we had so many issues we had to deal with because we didn't plan. We're so inexperienced, but then we learned and now we do better. Like now we learned the lesson. We know if I have to build a new shop, it's easy now because I know all the process, all the steps. And another thing is that that place, even though uh, everybody said was a bad choice, you knew in your, I wasn't sure, but Tico knew in his heart that, that was, was the, the place. place. And that place used to be a hair salon. Oh, yeah, too. So all the electrical and the plumbing was ready already. It saved us, I would say, about $30,000 in renovations because it was ready, right? We have the pipes for the plumbing. All the, the electrical, electrical set up for the barber stations. So this was so the rooms, helpful. The kitchen there where we built the, the kitchen. Laundry the laundry in the back. All the setup was already made. So if, you're, if you want to start a business, think about that if you choose a place that it was used with the same purpose before, it saves you tons of money. And time too. Mm -hmm. Then we start building, right? We built the, the, the shop and then we finally, in our minds, we finally like, now it's time to open. It's time to, mm. to do the grand open. Oh, and but we run out of money in the middle of the construction. Yeah. And then luckily, luckily, Tico had a $10,000 credit card <laughs> that we maxed out. Everything. And we used every little single penny we had. Uh -huh. from we, used the whole, we maxed out, yeah. From the little piggy coins. Big bank. Big bank. <laughs> every little cent we had, we put there, plus put the credit card that we had the at the time. Card. And we owe that credit card for another two to three years. So we paid the credit card. Another three years after. With interest and With everything. With interest and everything. Oh, my gosh. It was crazy. Yeah. Things that people don't know. But then uh, we will say we finally done. We have the last inspection. And the inspector come and he failed us. He failed us. So we, we, we run out of money. We maxed out the card. The rent will start uh, next month. Right? On That's that month on of that the month. inspection. We're planning the grand opening for the first week of April. April. Right? And uh -huh. then you're, you already told your previous place, like, I'm leaving. You know, I'm opening my own shop. So I'll be having the chair empty. You can put somebody else here. And then we're so, we scheduled the grand opening and everything. And then the inspector came and he failed us in the inspection. And that we had to pay one month. I don't know where we... I don't know either. We yeah, we get so that we, money from. I don't remember. We had to pay the rent that first week of April. was the f Because usually when you rent a commercial space, you the, can require two, three, six months of free depending rent. Depending on the deal. Depending the deal, on, the deal. on the deal. So you have time to build a place, right? And open. And we're so inexperienced. Thanks God I asked for three months. <laughs> because otherwise, I don't know. We would be so the lawyer screwed. Helped us. Yeah. <laughs> And then we failed the inspection. And this created a whole another issue with getting the license and permit for whatever job that was done previously. And the inspector said that I did and whatever, whatever. We had to wait one more month. And we had to pay the rent for that. Yes. So and I already quit my job because I was so certain like, okay, it's happening. We're opening. Right? It didn't happen. It didn't happen. We were so happy to do it. Yeah. But for the happening of all of us, we opened in, the f in 2017, May, May 1st. 1st. We opened in Victor's Barbershop. We opened uh, with me, my wife, and two other barbers, right? Yes, I think Louise it was Louise and Tyler. And Tyler. Yes. So it was 
two other barbers, Luis. Actually, I was the only one that had clientele Correct. because Luis came from Brazil in those months, or even maybe a, a year. He was new in the U.S. He was new in the U.S. No he had clients, no clientele. Just a few clients. But he had the gift. The kid is amazing. He has a huge heart. And he used to cut my hair. I used to cut his cousin head. That's why I met Luis. And once I met Luis, he introduced me to Dyler. Dyler is uh, uh, the barber that start with us. I'm grateful and blessed to have them for the first year. Correct. Right? Luis is still with us today. And then after Luis brought his wife, now is his wife at the time was his girlfriend. Was his girlfriend. Daddy, they're still with us. And actually, before her come to, because Luis started Dyler, and then Luis brought Daddy. But then Daddy, but Danilo. Then Danilo. Yeah. But Daddy, Luis and Daddy, Daddy said, I'm going to get, we, let's ma get married first, right? And they got married a month before she started with us. Correct. Right? I and think then, they got married the same month, May. The same month. I think they the got married in, yeah. Yeah. And, and then at the end of the month, she and started then she meeting. she came and joined us. And then I started the barbershop with me. I was the only one that has clients. Dyla was very fresh from Colombia. Danilo was very fresh from Brazil. Brazil. And Dottie used to have, she used to be a hairdresser. She used to, she know, she knew how to cut men's hair, but she was a hairdresser. She didn't have enough clientele. So I had to carry the whole shop working day and night to be able to pay the bills while I was planning and organizing myself to multiply myself and help my barbers to build a clientele. Yes. Right. I so remember you started inviting your clients to, co to with cut them. with them. And the, the first crew, I didn't train them, right? Correct. I they came already trained. They came already <laughs> trained. We didn't have standards or processes and system in place. Yeah. And I remember uh, Luis once, once they, he used to make less than $400 in his first months, right? Yes, so, we didn't see. have enough clients to keep them so busy, and right? we, Yeah, we, to keep them busy and happy to stay with us. Because mm -hmm. if they leave, w the shop will be closed. Right? We'll be closing the, the shop, doors, yeah. the doors. And it was me, my wife, and them. We had to do everything. My wife used to have to be the receptionist, taking phone calls, uh, making the marketing, taking pictures, cleaning the floor, helping uh, cleaning you guys. the bathroom, helping us. We had the 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 oven with towers though, with the hot hot towers already. Yeah. She was folding and put all the sand, washing in, towels, washing towers, cleaning the floor, taking phone calls, uh, walk-ins, booking appointments, and all that stuff. We used to do everything. In the beginning, you have to do every everything because we didn't have resources and money. To afford to have a team or a marketing agency or whatever. Or a receptionist. Or a receptionist or a cleaning crew. So we're doing basically everything. And we were open at 9 that then, that then back then, right? At 9 a.m. No, it was we used to open at 10, but we would get there very early and we close at 8. 10 okay. to 8. Yeah. It was long hours. Yeah, we used to close very early. Uh, we used to get there very early to organize all, st all that stuff before we start, before we start working. Mm -hmm. And after hours, we used to clean the shop, vacuum everything, mop everything, clean the Every bathroom. Every single day. Uh, put the towels in place, make sure everything was ready for next, next morning. Day. Right? I remember we were so tired. And Louise and Dari, they were very close to us and still... And you were asking, you guys, after hours, after 9 p.m., you said, you guys need help to clean the shop. And we used to say, no, that's our thing. That's our business. You, you're the barbers. You have to. Just clean your chair and your station. Make sure your station is clean and next morning you're going to be And ready. everything else, it's our responsibility. Our responsibility. You're not supposed to be here cleaning. And, and we, we would stay until like 11 midnight cleaning. 11 midnight cleaning. And next morning we had to be there very early. I remember my wife used to have cramps. Is that cramps? Mm -hmm. Used to have a lot of cramps or migraine or whatever we used to have. And I say, babe, uh, don't go to work today. Stay home. And she asked, who's going to stay in reception? I don't Who's have a boss to, to call and say I'm sick. I don't have a boss to call. I'm sick. Uh, if I'm sick, you know. Uh, it was tough. It was tough. Used to do everything, right? And I remember one day that uh, that day I 
did my whole cleaning because Tico and I divided the tasks, what I would do, what he would do to make it faster. I don't remember. I was so tired. I don't remember if I was sick or something. Then I did my whole cleaning. I closed the, the cash drawer. I did all my part. And then I I said, Tico, I'll go home. You just finished the floor. And then I went home. I took a shower. I was so tired. And Tico didn't come home. I was worried about like, what the heck's going on? Maybe he got in an accident or something. Maybe someone went there and stole the shop. I was worried about it. And then uh, because we have alarm, we have cameras. So I didn't get the message from the alarm that he was leaving. And I was like, okay, it would take him maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes to just, you know, mop the floor. So why he's not home yet? Then I look at the camera, what's going on? And I couldn't see Tico. I was looking at the camera and I was like, where is he? I look at the rooms. I wasn't seeing him in the cameras. And then I start worrying, what happened with my husband? And then when I finally gave a better look, I saw Tico sitting in the couch and watching TV. And we didn't have a TV in our home because we brought the TV to the shop. We couldn't buy one. So we didn't have TV in our house. And he was there sitting, <laughs> eating a soup and watching TV. And then I was, it was around almost midnight already. Yeah. And then I messaged Tico, what are you doing? And then he's like eating soup and watching TV. And that day, like I was, oh my gosh, like my husband doesn't have a TV at home. He has to stay at the shop. So tired after cutting, I don't know how many hairs. I used to cut 19 hairs, 20 hairs a day. And you're just there like watching TV. You already finished cleaning. And then you just sit with your soup, hungry and tired, and you're watching TV. So I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget the feeling like, oh my gosh, look what we're doing. We're working or I can send the word off because <laughs> it was tough. So when you see things, when you see a business, when you see a successful person, you don't know the struggles behind. There are other struggles that we can share in the next episodes, but there were so many struggles, but it was worth it. It was very worth every it. Every single one of them. Right? Now I know every single business owner, they've been through a lot. And I know why. And I have this uh, compassion that I know why they are successful. And I know how much the price they paid to be successful. And something that we didn't mention was we got married in, in January. Correct. We spent <laughs> some of the money in our in our wedding, wedding. Uh, we got married in Vegas. We got married on January third. I remember. I you don't know the day. No. Huh? January third. Yeah. You see, January January third, and we opened the shop in uh, uh, in May. Yeah. Twenty twenty seventeen. But the contract, the lease agreement, is started the month of January. The month now February. No, it started January, but January. we got a couple free. No, three months. months. Three, couple of free months. Correct. Uh -huh. But then they gave us the key. February few, few months. first, I think. That's when they handle us the key to start working on the construction. Yeah. Something like that. But we got married and then we spent <laughs> some of the money for the shop in our wedding. In our wedding. And it was her dream, you know. And I don't regret. No, we don't regret. Me too. So moving forward, I had the barbers there. I didn't train those barbers. We didn't have... Standards. The standards set up for uh, our processes to do things over there. No marketing. We're doing our organic marketing ourselves. Pictures, video. If you guys go, scroll down to. I, I deleted some of them because I'm ashamed. In the beginning, we're so inexperienced. So they're not all there nowadays. It shouldn't be. You should let them there. But <laughs> if you scroll down, you're going to see how the barbershop was, uh, how we uh, started. We were doing everything ourselves. We couldn't afford. afford. And actually, we start like understand that we need to grow ourselves. We need to, we need help, right? And we start education, educating ourselves, looking for education, how to become good leaders, how to become a uh, better business owner. And we understood that we need to have standards, we need to have a process to do all those things. So, And then with the help of Luis and Dari, 
of our team, actually, they gave us a lot of ideas to start uh, our standards, how we do the hot tower shave, how we do the process yes. from the time the client book and the time the client leave the chair. Those are a process, right? Mm -hmm. So they helped us to build that. And they helped know. us with the like having a dress code. Have no help. They yep. helped us so much to grow the business. They're they're still with they us. They play a huge role in the shop. Correct. In our life. And they're still by our side and they're supporting the changes, the improvements and being part of that. So it's important to have those people by our side. Every single one that we had in our team contributed somehow. Well, we are inf we're talking more about Liz and Dari because they're with us since day one. Day one. And they're still with us. So and they're a big part of everything we build together. We don't build anything by ourselves. Yeah, we need people and good people on our side. People that, f that has the same, vi not same vision, but the same principles and values uh, that we have. And they are the guardians of the culture today. They helped us. They support us in everything. They help and training new they barbers. They help train the new barbers and all that. Say they are one arm of Invictors. So, and then we built, we create this whole uh, standards. And one of the most challenging things that happened in, with me and my wife as a business people, as business owners, was finding barbers. Because I, think, I, I thought barbers was easy to find. find. Once you open the shop, I'll say, oh, I'm going to have tons of barbers because this barber shop is amazing. You see the chairs, the pool table, and, and all that. They want to work. They will want to work for us. But you know what? I failed. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. happen. And one of my f really good friends, he told me, Tico, I mentioned him about the barber shop, my dream, like years before. And so he told me if I had a barber shop the way I was telling him, I would have a line of barbers working with us want to work with us right it didn't work because i have i had those before i find those three i was searching meaning that calling other barbershop that is very not fair and that's ugly as hell you do that with other barbershop owners yes. but i, I didn't know better barbers from other i was shops. calling and recruiting barbers from other barbershop because yeah. i didn't know better better I was very immature. I didn't know if I was hurting that barbershop owner. But thank God none of them come. <laughs> you know, actually I actually I did that and I, I regret it. And I really encourage every single barbershop owners, if you are thinking to do that, if you're doing that, calling other uh, professions from other barbershop, you are, as a barbershop owner, you know how much that hurt. The, yes. the barbershop owner having one chair empty. So I really encourage you to not do that because if another barbers that work for someone else do it, they don't know how much that hurt the shop. But you know as a barbershop owner, right? Correct. You your owner, you know the pain. You know the pain. But we actually talk about these uh, issues we had in, in the other episode. episode where we shared the mistakes we made, right, the in the beginning. The mistakes, the mistakes uh, of a uh, business owner make in the beginning. So... You guys should watch, watch this episode one. on the Black Barber podcast, right? And actually your story. So we have kind of a, it's not a documentary, but we have a cool video where Tico share his story. And this video has uh, pictures. He has videos. So everything he shared here, there is a video showing more details. And you can actually on have YouTube. a sense. And I will leave this video in the description so you can watch it's a great video because then there are pictures of his childhood, his parents, and everything like Papalochi and Pito the shop, yeah. and the barbershop Invictus when we started. It has the whole process. So I encourage you to watch. It's a 20-minute video. It's a short video, but very inspiring. And I'll leave the link in the description so you guys can watch. I love that video and I cry every time I watch it. <laughs> I encourage you guys to watch. And since we created the whole st structure of the business, all the standards, and every time I needed to find some a barber, the barber didn't have enough like skills or it didn't fit the vision. It didn't have the enough. Because I had the vision of giving experience to my clients. And nobody has those skills in a way I want it. You know, it was my my responsibility. 
And I found out that I had to train my own guys, you know, and every single barbers that start working with us, since I know the I knew the process, all the standards, all the steps to be able to provide an excellent service to our clients, I noticed like, whoa, I'm not gonna find a barber that is ready to work under our uh, vision, under what I need to offer and deliver to my clients. So I need to train every single one. So then I start hiring bar- hiring barbers uh, and train them in Victor's way, how we do the hot towel shaves, how we start cutting, how to finish, how to be clean, how to be more professional. And I start training everyone and then uh, everybody, every single barber. And then I found out, right, babe? I found out that I found out that I loved how I was training those guys. I said, whoa, this is amazing thing. You you pass it on knowledge. You pass it on uh, the stick they call. I'm giving them the opportunity to become a better professionals, you know. And then I found out I love to teach. You know, people say, Tico, wow, you know so much. Thank you. You helped me so much. And every single barber that wor- used to work with us, they not with us today, but they always very grateful for what I I teach them back then. They be, became a greater professional. I still talk to them, and they tell me those, and they're always thankful. They're grateful. I found out that I, I fell in love with education, and once I fell in love with education, but I wasn't that barber. You know, I didn't born a business owner. I didn't born a uh, with all the skills that I have today. I didn't have, I didn't born with all the skills that I had today. And I had, since I found out the love for education, I didn't know how to create a methodology. I didn't have a methodology. I didn't know how to create the methodology. I didn't know the methodology. And I didn't have all these skills. And I started looking for how can I grow as a barber? You know, how can I improve and develop my skills so so I can, I will be able to help all the barbers that start working here with us. And I start taking courses. I start taking uh, online courses and traveling and taking workshops. Uh, and I was aiming the best of the industry. I was aiming to Josh LaMonica from Inspire, Vidal Sassoon. I took online course with Josh OP uh, at the end now. Uh, barb- barbers, famous barbers came from Brazil and gave us courses over there. We are, I was open to become a better professional so I could reproduce my team. I could how, replicate who I was becoming, who the barber that I was getting better being at, and I was replicating that in my guys. So that's why uh, we have so su- successful barber shop because I replicate myself in other barbers, and now they are providing amazing uh, service to the uh, to the clients. To the clients, you wouldn't be able to have the high standard of quality if you didn't help them develop their skills, because no one is born ready. And what is the chance they're gonna find just the best of the best barbers to work with you by your side? If they are the best, they're already working for someone else. They're already working at they're the shop. They're working on their own dream, on their probably. Own dream, probably. They're renting a suite, or they're opening a shop, or they already have a shop. So. Um, I think this was an important step of our success is that you decide, you understood how important it was first for you to learn the skills and then replicate teaching your team those skills those and skills. helping them, preparing them to be better professionals. I think that that's one of our secrets. That's one of Taking our secrets. Taking all this time and effort because it's not easy training someone and helping them. It takes a lot of hours and Tico would do these after hours he work all day cutting hair like crazy and training them at night on Sundays on the days the shop are closed so it's a lot of effort and a lot of hours of your time of your life guiding them helping them but at the end we're building an amazing team we're building something really cool that I'm proud of everything you've been doing and teaching them and helping them grow and become better barbers and and remember that uh, companies doesn't build people, doesn't build team. Team builds the company, right? Always. Correct. We need them. And and the we company. We need to help people. Yes. To become the team we are uh, dreaming of. They were not born ready. No one is born ready. 
and actually become a really good barber. How I become wasn't enough because now I had a team and I, I had people working with us and I had to become a better leader, right? Correct. A better leader. And then we start taking courses and workshop, reading books and investing in ourselves to become a better leaders, a better boss, you know, and offer more to our team and to our clients. So I finally uh, fell in love with education since I know so much, I become an educator. And my first course, my first workshop was in 2018 or 19, at the end of 2018. Yeah, the first one that you gave as a teacher, I think was end of 2018. Mm -hmm. And my first uh, workshop was for free, for it was a team, uh, a salon team, my, my friend, she owns a salon, and she helped me, she brought her whole team, and I was teaching that class, I teach for free the class so I could get more experience and know how to teach and, and broke the ice and validate your methodology, my, my methodology, right? To see if whatever you created would actually work, if they would learn, if they would understand the instructions. They would have a, objections and questions. So I was so afraid. And then yeah. I start teaching. Oh, no, wait. But before that, before you actually offered your workshop, you started teaching demo classes in barber schools, I was, right? I was saying that now. Not before, wasn't. In, 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 I think you started before, and then um, when feel. they saw you posting that you're actually everything started with you posting that you're training your team, and then schools in the area yeah, were asking, "Hey, the, Tico, uh -huh, can you come and thought. give a demo class?" Yeah, and the barber shop, barber schools, and cosmetology schools. Since I was training my team, I was posting all the time, and it started creating this. Uh, what's happening? This guy's teaching now, and. And then they start calling me to their school, and I was teaching. Uh, that was good for me because I was growing, I was evolving, you know, my skills of communication and uh, speaking, Correct. public speaking and stuff. And I was going to Barbie schools, and I forgot. <laughs> I was, I, I, I totally forgot. One thing about barber schools, guys, they really need barbers and cosmetologists and professionals to go there and do demonstrations. They are desperate for professionals that could go there, motivate the students and actually show them something and share how is the real world after they finish school. So be that person. Um, you don't need to do that every week, every month, but try to do, I don't know, twice a year, Commit to do that and inspire these people that are starting starting their careers because when you go there and you meet the students and you share what you know and you share your experiences. You might think that you don't know enough, but you always know something that someone else don't doesn't know. Doesn't know, yeah. And be that person. Be supportive to the people that are starter in, starting in the industry and you see how good it feels to be able to go there and share and meet the students and be the person that can maybe give a motivational word for them. Sometimes they're thinking about giving up, they're having a hard time in life. You can become the inspiration that would change their life forever. Like if she, if this girl, if this guy made it, I can make it too. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give up because it's tough going to school. It's a lot of money, a lot of hours. And people sometimes have financial aids and they have to work and they have kids and they have this whole situation happening and they're thinking about giving up because it's tough. Or maybe they don't find a job because shops and salons want professionals with experience and clientele. And you could be the person saying, hey, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up because I was in your skin one day and here I am. You're going to make it. The so. more you teach, the more you learn as well. You Correct. Know, that's how I learned how to teach, how to speak, and all that. The so what keep, happened yeah. to you was you started being invited by the schools, and it was a great opportunity for you to learn as well? Yes. And then you started offering workshops? At the barbershop. At and the then barbershop. we have Invictus Academy, where we teach. Uh, nowadays, we teach from, from apprentice to advanced class at the Invictus Academy. And that's what I love to do. That is my purpose. It is, it is, like I say in the beginning, uh, something that I found as my purpose is to teach other people and help other people in my industry. As I told you guys in the beginning, that's my purpose for life. That's how I'm still doing, and we are about to launch a um, 
online course, but that's a secret for now. Is, yeah, don't tell anybody. Is this you year, heard. Is this year some in some months, some month Correct. that will happen? And the thing is, uh, Tico learned uh, through, through all these experiences, right? You learn how to create a methodology, how to test the methodology, validate the methodology to provide the best learning experience to people so they can learn fast and really understand the concept you're teaching them. So you use all your experience plus the classes you took, Josh LaMonica, Vidal Sassoon, uh, Eagle Barbers, Eagle Barbers yep. Paul Mitchell. So all the things you studied, you create your own methodology in a way that it makes the process of learning simple and easy. So you had to develop that skill. You think about this way. Tiku was the kid that didn't learn with dyslexia. You didn't mention you also have dyslexia, dyslexia. and HDAD. HDAD. You had such a hard time in life, right? In the school that or creates learning. creates a huge problem now in the, the title or life that I live now, uh, all the, the, the demands from the standards from the society and, and being a business owner, I had to learn all this stuff, right? Correct. And you had to learn as an adult. That's crazy. Like you had to learn how to read and write properly and you had to learn the skills to like, so HDAD and dyslexia, does not affect your results in life to be more organized to organize time and tasks and being not being late with customers so you had to learn so many things when you're like 34 35 years old it's much more challenging that if if you learn as a kid so you had to overcome so many challenges to uh, be able to succeed in your business and in your workshops and then you're the person, as I said in the beginning, that if you think about it, your life story, where you came from, you had no chance looking at... Backwards. Yeah, like you had no chance of being a successful business owner because you had no resources, no, no nothing. How you would make it, right? And you did. So I hope this motivates whoever is watching, watching this video. That it doesn't matter. Don't look at the circumstances. Don't look at your now. Like, okay, now I don't have the money. Now I don't have the resources. Well, how can I get it? How can I do it? Just start moving. Just start <clears throat> doing something. And as I said, God will align the right people, the knowledge, the workshop, or whatever you need. And things will start happening in your life. And then, do you want to talk more about the Barber Academy, or you want to go forward to the podcast project? Yeah, let's do. Let's uh, just finish the, the academy. So now I go and I help other barber shops and salons as well. I travel to other states and teach, and I love to do that. So just what something that I really recommend is you guys find your purpose, find what you love to do. If you are a barber, you have the gift to be behind the chair, making someone life day uh, better. If you are an educator, you can teach others and pass it on, everything you know. You have this gift. So that's what I recommend. And when I keep moving, help me with this. <laughs> All right. So one thing about HDAD is that Tico has a hard time putting things in Aligned. sequence. Yeah. Right. So he has all this information is spinning in his head and then he doesn't know what to say first or the sequence or the time frame. Right. Baby? It's something that if you have age, I don't have HDD, but if you do have, you'll be feeling like, oh, that's how I feel about things that he has a hard time putting them in the right sequence. What I should say first, what I should start first. And I think this also kept you stuck for a while until you met me and you i was the one telling you do this first do this after i think you really guided me yes because you had all the ideas but you didn't know where to start what do i do first and then i think i was the person helping you, you put came it into my life you organized my life babe yeah and then uh going you know forward with our story um we one day we decided not we, Tico, right? He's the one with the ideas. He's the crazy one. But before moving, uh, you're going to the Black Belt Barber, right? You're going to the studio. Correct. Okay. You want to talk? So, yeah, I want to talk about the shop. So, now, okay. nowadays, we have a successful barbershop. We have an amazing team. We are creating 
new things. We're having new things coming next year. This year. Right? Oh, this this year. Sorry, <laughs> 2023. And they will help the barber industry. And I'm so happy. My wife doesn't work in the front desk. We're able now to provide to our team, to provide for our own uh we are able to pay the a um marketing company our earn, uh, accountant for everything everybody that helped us we are able to pay these people because throughout this process we learn we educate ourselves we grow the business grow what's the word you say when you grow the business only grow when you grow right that's yes. the word that's the that's business the grow place. only when you grow so now we are able to do social projects too you want to oh, share yeah. that Okay, so the social projects are something you're really passionate about. And this is started, uh, I don't know, I think me and you, we always, had in, we always had in our hearts this give back feeling. We love giving back, right? I, I remember like Tico used to do so many free haircuts for people. If, he, if one of his clients lost a job, he was like, don't worry, you're not going to pay until you find a new job. Or sometimes he would go to people's house if they were sick, if they did a surgery. He would go to the hospital. Or if they are senior and they couldn't leave the yeah. house. He would do so many things for free. And um, we had the opportunity to participate in a back-to-school project where we cut kids' hair for free before they go back to school. And then, of course, we have partners that you can do everything yourself so we partner with a church with a local church and with other business owners the and city coconut creek city the city so this project started really small it started with our barbers louise and daddy cutting kids hair at the bathroom of the church for free and then we did something bigger the next year where we joined the whole team and then we did something bigger the following year and bigger and bigger and every year we're able to cut more kid and pr more kids and provide more free backpacks and barber supplies. No, barber, no. Uh, oh, school supplies. School supplies. <laughs> school supplies. Yeah. And it's just growing bigger and bigger. And I look forward to that day every single year. Like, I'm so excited to be able to be there and serve those kids and so serve those parents that can't afford a haircut. A haircut. And when you were a kid, right, you couldn't afford a haircut. Your dad would cut your hair. Yeah. And then... <laughs> You, you want to talk way he about wanted. it? <laughs> My dad used to cut the hair the way you want. I just don't want to move forward for with you that. But you couldn't ask for, I a couldn't ask for a specific haircut. haircut. He cut, he, he said all his uh, child needs to be with a short hair so you don't get lice. Lice? Yeah, yeah lices. Lice, right? <laughs> lices, so. And now we're able to provide the, cut, the kids, the kids um, this amazing experience of coming to the barber shop, choosing their own haircut, and they ask, I want a line right here, I want this way, I want that way. And barbers can do so much for the community, right? Yes, we can contribute a lot with the community. And it has nothing to do with, with money. money. It has to do maybe donating your time. Um, we want to start a project with the homeless population and being able to help them feel good and recover their self-esteem and put their life together. So we're partnering with um, institutions, nonprofits that take care of homeless population. Our team will, will come on board and help us. Yes, to provide them haircuts and beard trims and make sure they look good, they feel great. And there are so many things you can do as a Barbara. beauty professional. A professional. So yep. don't take the time to think how you can contribute, how you can give back. It's a gift, and you have the power in your hands to make people feel great, feel good, and look good. You know what's something that we forgot about? The what? tattoo. Yeah, so the tattoo is a whole a new story. Uh, so you want to talk about the tattoo? A quick. It took us two years fighting with the city because the city of Coconut Creek didn't allow tattoo activities in Coconut City, and they still don't allow tattoo shops. They only allow like 15%, 14%. Within your shop, inside your uh, barbershop or salon, if you do a micropigmentation or how do you call this? Microblading. Microblading stuff mm -hmm. or tattoo, it owns about 15% in a shop, meaning that you have like a spot there, like a, a, room. a little a room or suite that you can rent, you can work the way you want it. They only allow that because uh, for two years we fought with the city to be able to be 
license like like how can you explain that license license to do license tattoos. to do tattoos so we were the first first barbershop the first company in coconut creek allowed to have tattoo inside the the inside the shop, shop, inside inside the company. So basically, the we had to change the city laws. Yeah. So we had the fight with the landlord regarding the tattoo. He didn't want to. And then he finally accepted. And then after we opened the shop, we're looking for an artist to join our team. And then when we finally found the artist and we went to the city to do the whole process because it involves health department, involves the city. So there's a whole thing you have to deal with it, right? For to two years, we had meetings in front of the but mayor. But before and all that, them. we actually went there to get the license. And then the city said, nope. I said, how do you, what do you mean, no? No, you're not allowed to have tattoo. And I said, how come? This, the activity of tattoo is prohibited in Coconut Creek. There is no way you can ever have a tattoo if artist. If someone was doing back then, they were illegal. doing... It was illegal. It was against the yeah. law. And then I was like, what? Why? Yeah, that's the law. You can't. And then we were so sad because we found the artist. That was my dream. To that her. was your dream. And then we had this big no, and there is no way you can get it. Okay. As I said, God always aligned things the way it should be. Um, we had the pleasure of meeting the mayor of Coconut Creek, and he became our client. And Maybe. one day, yep. Tico was telling him um, his plans to have the tattoo, but he couldn't. So we're figuring out what we're going to do with the room, if we're going to do something else, maybe other services or whatever. And then he's like, how come you can't? And Tico said, yeah, there's a law. And the mayor is like, mm, I'm going to look into it. And then he found that it, the law exists and it would be very beneficial to other business owners to be allowed to have the tattoo service. Because as he said, microblading, scalp micropigmentation, um, anything related to the tattoo was prohibited. So he put a project to be voted and it was a long process. He advocated for us. He advocated for us. We had to go there in front of the commissioners, the mayor, vice mayor, everybody, and explain the benefit of changing that law and the way they changed this, allowing the service tattoo to be performed. There's a lot of restrictions. There's a lot of, you know, rules you have to follow, but it is allowed now because of us. You only have to get a permit, right? Um, so there is more involved because it involves involved, the yeah. health department. But now the city of Coconut Creek will allow tattoo. There's a lot of, of course, rules and regulations, specific businesses that can have that service done. But it will, it only happened because of us, because we were trying to do something new. And at the end, the whole city is, is now able, all the business owners that qualify since we have a shop, uh, barbershop or hair salon or med spas they can offer microblading and tattoo services so we are very positive because we are always like go after and fight for it correct we had to fight big fights throughout these um, six years right even for the the beer on tap to have a beer uh have to serve, beverage, alcohol, to serve right? alcohol because once i we spoke to the city i think they said you, you're not allowed and then I told you, you're gonna say, no, nope, you're not gonna have beer there because you're not allowed. And I say, no, I'm gonna find a way. I always do that, right? Yeah. There's a way, so everything's possible. That's what I said. And I had this lawyer, he, he was my client back then, he was a friend, and I called him and say, I'm gonna check that in for you. And he checked and we- There was know. no restriction, so we could. It was just the city that was being, hard on us saying yeah. no you cannot have it yeah. but we actually could so we started the process of the license involves other departments and everything health department the bpr but we were allowed and now uh, not since the first year i think 2017 we have beer on we tap beer we on can tap. serve beer on tap and wine and it's all the right way meaning we have the license we have the insurance we have the whole permits and everything so we're doing the right way but imagine if we just gave up and like oh just gave they up. said no uh -huh. so we're fighting a lot but of fights dr yeah dream would fail if we just accept yes and then the studio right what happened with the studio do you want to talk about the studio 
that you had this Actually, idea? Actually, I, I had the idea because I was listening to a Gary Vee video and he said, you should be, well, you should be in a platform that the people that you in your, there are in your industry are not on it to be able to not succeed, but it's to be able to be more, what's the word? To be able to see more vis visible and expose yourself more there. And then I start thinking, what kind of platform I should I be to be able to expose my, uh, my, um, to how do I share your it? knowledge, to share my knowledge and give, uh, share information, what I've been doing and help my community of Barbary, barbering community. And I, I mentioned to my wife and then we start looking for a, uh, no, baby. Run. no, why do you skip the steps? Let's <laughs> do the details. I'm very detailed. So you had this idea to start a podcast for Barbara so you could share your knowledge for yeah, free that's what because you do listen to a lot of podcasts and these pod me too. And these podcasts help us so much. We listen podcasts about different uh, things, yep. but it helps us so much to learn with someone that has experience in that field or maybe just inspiring us with their story. In this so, video, I think is from Ga Gary V. Uh, Gary V was in a part, someone else podcast. Yeah. And then you had this idea. You search and you didn't find podcasts for barbers, specifically barbers being podcasters, right? And this was... Uh, so 2022, this was 2021. And then Tico had this idea, why not to start a podcast for barbers? And then you came to me and gave me the idea, let's start a podcast for barbers. And like always? No, and usually I would say, <laughs> okay, Tico, we're too busy. Just another idea. Is we're too busy. We have so many things to do. Like, no. But then I was like, oh, that's such a great idea, podcast. And I like the idea. And we started searching for a studio where we could record the podcast, how we would be able to make that happen. And then making a long story short, we didn't find the studio that we liked the quality of the video, the quality of the sound, or even, you know, the decoration, the environment, the table, the setup. And the hours were not like, the best hours for us because we work so much and we recording crazy hours <laughs> so just to give you an idea sometimes we're here like midnight 1 a.m recording content for you it's a lot of effort involved to be here recording and the studios didn't accommodate our crazy schedule and also the price it would be very pricey to uh high uh rent the studio and then have help of you know people posting we couldn't afford that project. So then we were so passionate about this idea. Let's start this podcast. We're going to make it happen. That we decided that since we couldn't find a studio, we decided we're going to build our own studio. Our own studio. And then we started looking for spaces. For We initially wanted to rent a room, an office room or something, because we don't have space at the barber shop. We don't have where to put everything. And we had no experience at all in podcast yeah or cameras or microphones or the equipment and no experience at all and then as usual tico has the ideas and then he's like make it happen he just gave the idea and i have to handle everything else like i want this way specifically like this that's the color of the table that's da -da -da. he gives me all the description and he's like make it happen <laughs> and then we start researching uh, and we built our own studio. So we created Invictus Podcast Studios. It's a concept that doesn't exist, which is a self-service uh, studio, meaning you come and record yourself. And the same concept of Airbnb. Airbnb. And then you receive a training the first time, but the whole setup is made in a way that you can easily record your podcast. And then you don't need post-editing. So that's why I have this thing in my hand and I switch cameras like this. And then we teach our clients. So now we have the studio for ourselves. So we can record our own. Make the Black Bell Barber podcast happen. But other people can take advantage of this space and also record their content and share their knowledge. And can you talk about the purpose? Why we do, why we build the studio? What is the purpose behind? Because everything we do has a purpose. We don't just do, oh, because I want to make money. What when is it started? 
<laughs> so actually, I, I start and I engage. So you start and I engage in the conversation. So. Got it. So um, everything we do has a purpose. Our businesses they have purpose, and the purpose is not money. Money is just a consequence, consequence. of a good job done with love and perseverance and everything so the purpose of the studio is to allow people to create content and spread good messages in the internet so nowadays there's a lot of great content online but there's also really bad content that is causing harm to kids to teens to teens and even adults spreading misinformation or messages that shouldn't be spread of hate or whatever it might be the case so the whole purpose here is to allow people to take a proactive action and instead of just watching this happen actually start becoming content creators and helping other people with their knowledge bringing um, information good information so this is a studio where people can come create their content post on the internet and make sure we have a better internet with more good information good messages out there yes. that's the whole purpose do you want to say something yeah that's the whole purpose <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then so one thing became another thing that became another, another thing, thing and now we have more than one business and imagine if Tico was afraid or victimizing himself like oh no or I let the past take, o take over of my future you know? yes like poor me you know i come from and blame uh, blame all the people and blame uh, blame all the the teachers and people that curses me so mm -hmm. blame your parents yeah. they didn't give me the opportunities i needed they didn't give me the money to start my own shop yeah, i wouldn't be here today exactly so i think that's it it's important to share his story we never shared here officially in the and podcast with all the details right if you want to see the video i mentioned don't forget it's in the description the link it's an amazing video that shows pictures and videos of tico's childhood and the whole process of building invictus i'm very passionate about that video that video inspired so many people and, and we'll keep inspired we'll keep inspiring i hope this video this this story that I shared, my story, my actually a little bit of my, my, my wife's story too. I hope this inspired you guys and help you somehow. And one day someone helped me and probably, and this is the most important thing for me and my wife. Like she said, we are passionate about to give back to help other people. So my whole story here on a table for you guys in detail and I would like to thank, before you finish, we would like to thank every single person that has been following Invictus Podcast, um, following the, the Black Bell Barber and watching us, our audience. And, and if you do have any, any, I think, anything in mind that you'd like to see in this podcast, please write it down here on the comments, share these stories and many other videos that we posted here with a lot of good information for barbers and people you know, in the barber industry, right? And I, I hope this year, 2023, will be a uh, amazing year for everybody and a blessed year. So thank you very much for watching. The more you learn, the more you earn. Babe, you are the best. I was watching you uh, here talking. So I, I like to listen to you. So this podcast is, is sponsored by Invictus Podcast Studios. Follow me, Tico Invictus. Thank you very much. And I'm so grateful for everything that happened in my life. And I, uh, how do I say? I want the same thing for you guys. I want to God bless your life as well.